the midseason. It's done. It's dusted. We have a champion. One that I'm sure surprised everybody. It was shocking. It was uh, absolutely flabbergasting that the Atlanta Reign walked through nearly uncontested. Uh, but to help us break us break the entire event and some of the more recent news literally happened like 30 minutes ago down. Uh, Custa's joining the show. Thank you so much for coming in and coming to hang out for a little bit. No worries. Thanks for having me on again. It's always fun chatting with you guys. Oh, thanks. Yiska, how are things? Busy. <laughs> Busy. What a week. What a week. <laughs> <laughs> and, it ju- and it keeps coming and it don't stop. It is a constant revolving door in this eSport. Yeah. Let me tell you. Yeah, for sure. Obviously, mid-season, any, any you know, initial takeaways are we you know was it was it nice to see you know fans back in the in, in the arena was it nice to also hear i mean custom you guys got like some of the, the had to have felt some of the energy from the crowd as well right yeah no it was uh it was awesome to have like a playoff event anytime where you have like loser can choose the map choice i feel like we just get better games like overall and i think we saw like a couple mm. of like the best games of the season this sure. weekend uh i wish it was a little bit longer like it felt like just as it was starting to get spicy, it kind of ended. Mm-hmm. Um, but, you know, that, that's the way things go this season, unfortunately. True. True. Sure. Jessica, any takeaways? We finally got back at, back at home, live arenas? Look, that, I'll, I'll play with you. Like, I've, I, I was at the Dota Major. I was at uh, MSI. Mm-hmm. And now, like, seeing the art that Korean fans draw onto these cards is crazy. <laughs> like, the quality of that is <laughs> so much higher. <laughs> like, it's, it's insanity. Like their stick figures, like even their stick figures look good. Yeah. It's, yeah. yeah. I, I don't know. But High tier stuff. I, I thought like overall, like it was really well done. I think you could kind of tell that it was not the greatest time window for Korea either, just because like mm. attendance... I felt a little bit for the camera operators having to find the correct angles for <laughs> for some of those days at least. I think the finals that was actually pretty well populated. Yeah, it was pretty well, yeah, yeah, it was good. Um, the energy was sweet, and yeah, I don't know. It's just good to have people, you know, in one physical location. And we also got mm. some sweet interviews out of it. I know I I went on a bit of a cry fest before the event based on the content we had beforehand. But yeah, I think the the interviews. Uh, helped of course like there's always things to re- uh, reiterate upon and then the games were also really good uh, there was mm-hmm. very few series that were just uncharacteristically bad I think the only one that comes to mind that I didn't even really watch was the Florida Boston one right that wasn't yeah, great. yeah that one was it, it wasn't great Boston kind of just like packed it up and they were like you know we're pretty happy here and then they just sort of like <laughs> let it go that's Florida it, did come in in a heater yeah <laughs> yeah it didn't even make sense but the, the rest were all like there was honestly based on scrim results I'm really happy f- with how APEC teams performed <laughs> because I didn't think ah. they'd, they'd even you know get considerably close winning a series and then they did so it actually yeah they spark ended up I think narrowly being the very Florida narrowly yeah. but nonetheless Maybe a bad day at the office, and we'll, we'll get into that. But uh, before we dive in, because I do want to get touch back with the uh, the stock exchange, maybe maybe we can uh, milk some some blood from the stone there. We'll see. Uh, but we do have to celebrate and and thank the people who make the show happen. So thank you to the patrons and the YouTube members who uh, you know got us to where we are. Three hundred plus episodes. That's super dope. And Custis here. That's crazy. Um, so thank you so much. To our patron producers, Battlecry, Brief Envy, and Broadspot, Buhau, Picasso, Chris Art, 34444, Kasha 67, Lotion, Pork Chop, Sammy, Rexane, Follow Mullen, Sugar High, and our YouTube members, IMDRW, Brother, Adam L, Sagi Fumi, Ice M Jello, Fire Element 6, AK, and Chris R. Yiska, you talked about how you were excited that APAC did as well as they did. Mm-hmm. What are you what do you mean when you say that? Was that like, <laughs> are they really doing that bad? Like you didn't think they were getting maps? Yes, maybe. Um, <laughs> okay. so I feel like still, and that's, mm-hmm. that's also, I tweeted that as well. And I still believe this, especially yeah. like the hardware is there. Okay. Mm, mm, mm. Mm. The problem is that they don't have the software because they don't have the training programs to, you know, install it. They sure. need more exposure to, uh, top NA teams. 
in order to catch up. And I think at that point, Inferno's unlikely to get to the Outlaws and especially Rain level. But just below that, I think like both Spark and um, and Infernal have shown that there is something there that they could get there, right? Like reliably, mm -hmm. I would say even Spark in that Florida match reached that level, even though that was kind of iffy on both parts, I think. Um, but yeah, like I, I think just based on uh, on the scrim results beforehand, it was pretty rough and. Yeah, um, the problem also is that the level of play generally in APAC because of the, yeah, the sort of like the well drying up a little bit in uh, Contenders Korea as well, mm. is, it's just not the same if you have like, you know, proper O2 to practice against and then your oh, for sure. next yeah. best team is like, now what is it, Poker Face or whatever? And um, like even there, they, that those teams were already being broken apart because of um, yep. transfers, right? So they yep. weren't performing at the highest level in order to prepare, prepare. And then maybe it's also not the greatest matter for the, both of those teams. So like I'm hopeful that the gap could be closing depending on what kind of a meta we get, especially towards playoffs. Because theoretically, and maybe we'll talk about it, but probably in for two meta switches for the rest of the season. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, I mean, with the the news that came out, I think uh, you know, whether it was on broadcast, maybe Tessa, you can can jog my memory. Um, was that on the broadcast, or was that just like a piece of news that came out like at like a sideline? Like, I think it came alongside. up in the pre-show when they were talking okay. about it. Right. I think they. Uh, I'm gonna throw a date out there, but I'm not 100 percent sure on this. I think it was August 25th yes. is when I think the date was that hmm. um, they were saying that there will be the new flashpoint into the game yes. i think yeah. it was I so, so i don't know if that includes season six hero i would assume it would if you're putting it flashpoint does, yeah. in you're probably adding the new hero at the same time as well so yeah like it, it'll be awesome to see more meta shifts i think this meta was fun it's always fun to have a dive meta but i think mm -hmm. it as all as with all things it lasted a little bit too long but that's yeah. usually just because of you want to keep the competitive integrity plus like the junker queen changes were just yeah. like pretty ridiculous like and we didn't want that to directly affect the midseason madness so you know it, it sort of added that fluidity to the mm. tournament but i don't know it, it feels like we've been playing sombra for a while and like yeah. going back to what yiska said is like i just don't think apac were as good at sombra like they obviously mm. when you saw those teams go up against the best sombras it felt like they were just they were playing the one-to-one -one matchup worse i feel like the translocators were getting caught they were getting isolated a lot more they just you know apac has a lot of interesting looks and tried a lot of different things and i think that hurt them in the overall somber meta when push came to shove yep i think uh echoing a point that seems to be only more etched in stone the more that we see him play it is lip and it's everybody else and nobody really really comes close right everybody else is just a little bit behind their emps are a little slower their their solo little plays and then to be fair to lip like well i guess maybe not fair but you know to bully him a little bit um you know he's he's not without his his flaws sometimes he's going for those like little assassinates and sometimes they they miss um but yeah no i i wholeheartedly agree i think one of the big things you bring up the like the translocators like not a lot of people you know we're not seeing a ton of like community attraction to like that being something that you need as a somber player to kind of keep track of. And that was something that I thought happy did beautifully um, qualifying for the event. Um, and that, that initial head to head where, you know, I felt like on, I think it was sub level on Antarctic peninsula versus Houston, where yeah. he's just haunting him down. He's just looking for translocators. Like he is, he's, he's, he's got a blood scent. He's ready to pounce. Like it was, it was very intentional. The, the stuff that, that, you know, junk book had happy do, but, yeah, no. I also I like I want to add a point there. I also think mm. that's one of the reasons that the APAC teams did the best against the Florida Mayhem because the Florida Mayhem are the team that I think are the uh, least proficient at the Sombra and they have a little bit of other things that they play mm -hmm. and they don't. That's not really their primary strength, in my yep. opinion. So I think that's why you saw Florida struggle against both of those teams because they were getting matched in that aspect. Yep, and I think that was kind of like the. The, the blessing and the curse, I guess, proverbially, and it, it's kind of a cliche to say, but it really was like the double edged sword for Florida where it's like, yeah, you're not going to 
you're not going to be able to do the sombra dive you're not going to match them you you have some of the pieces but it's very clear that you feel uncomfortable with it mm. but you have all these you know you have the ramatra comp you have merit on hit scan which is fantastic that's you know a, a very comfortable wheelhouse for him to be put in checkmate you know god bless him he's making these these crazy hero plays i think it was versus boston on that on one of those last fights on antarctica where like he's like kind of stealthily like crouch walking past everybody he gets like the blizzard on the ana he ice blocks like a sleep dart just making hero plays um but it was very clear that like they didn't want to play the meta and i felt like that was kind of the strat to like pull everybody down to like this some weird like god bless him rest him we'll, we'll talk about him like the chung do zone almost and try to you know throw him a curveball a little bit but yeah i i mean you kind of have to also take the 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 bullet there where it's like yeah you're you're also not playing the best comp so yeah you're probably gonna yeah. struggle a little bit right yeah no absolutely yiska yeah do we like florida <clears throat> i think like this is also probably yeah this, this is just not their ideal meta i think generally mm. speaking any meta that has sombra is a problem for parity in this league just because lip gaps and as you get onto hard hit scans it might be pointing towards i think that's when the field opens up right then you have mm -hmm. like way more superstars across the level that are, have comparable levels and also but based on the day-to-day -day, you know can just take over a match right like i'm not sure like i feel like i don't know put someone like hydron on the sombra gets gapped by lip 10 out of 10 times hit scan mm -hmm. maybe eight out of seven seven out of ten times you know yeah so that that provides like a healthy variance and it's not bullshit variance it's hard-earned skill variance yeah um that makes it fun to observe right this is just <laughs> and then also like stalker was also on one this entire weekend Oh, yeah, crazy yeah. also b by the way joe crazy vindication <laughs> I, I don't know if you remember like oh this, i remember the the uh, episode we did with johnny where i was like mm -hmm. i'd i'd rather take stalker over profit don't feel bad about that take now like yep, that's yep. it's kind of feels like this kid is the truth of course it's really hard to talk about the individual levels on the atlanta rain given that everyone is nuts on this team um yeah. And therefore, everyone also looks like the best player, and everyone should be role star, and probably everyone should be well on be. an MVP or uh, yeah. rookie rookie of the year ballots. Like, just slot them in, right? And they probably take it at this point as well. Keep in mind, like, depending on when the nominations come in, most of the matches that are in consideration for MVP have already been played by midseason, um, yeah. at least historically. Feels like all of those guys should be front runners, right? Like, it's it's actually a one of the most impressive seasons of a franchise yet. Yeah, I don't think anyone, any franchise, like we talk about the domination of like San Francisco Shock and like Vancouver Titans when they first came into the league. And like they were dominant, but I think something big that you have to like go against more, actually more Shanghai Dragons in 2020. Mm -hmm. Was it 2021? Yeah, 2021. Yep. I think that's the closest thing that we would ever have uh, mm -hmm. to this level of dons because when the Shock and the Vancouver Titans were dominating, they had each other. Right, right. Yeah. To like, to like exactly. hold each other accountable. Shanghai Dragons, when we were playing that wrecking ball composition, Dallas Fuel were close, but towards the end, it wasn't close. While yeah. Atlanta Reign, that's their Houston. Like Houston is close, and we saw that in the upper bracket final. You know that three-two between Atlanta and Houston. But at the end of the day, Atlanta is the better team, and I think they're head and shoulders. The one thing that I'm excited about is to see if they can do it in another meta. You know, um, obviously they have that trump card with Lip and the Sombra. If we move in a different direction, I think we can all agree they're still going to be one of the best teams, if not the best team. But where is the gap, right? Like how mm. big is their margin to the rest of the teams? Yep. And I think it's probably a safe assumption, right? I won't speak for Jessica, but, you know, my opinion is that it's probably cool. It, it, it closes a little bit. But when you look at the pedigree of these players, when you look at Lip, it's like, you know, we've had him play Tracer in this in seasons in the past, and he's actually looked like an phenomenal Tracer. And we saw him a little bit at this event, but again, not something maybe he scrimmed a ton of. You know, you give him ample practice time, ample preparation time, he's going to come out and look like gangbusters on... We saw him last year on Sombra. We've seen him on Tracer. Like, he seems like he's got way more depth than I think people really let on, where they just, like, kind of meme and 
can write him off as like the sojourn maybe a sombra player and like some two trick and it's just like that's not the case same thing with stalker where it's like yeah this kid is like one of the best if maybe not the best mechanical tracer we have in the league right now but did you see him on echo have you looked at his contenders performances in the past where like his genji actually looks kind of good and like mm. like he's he's got some depth there and then you've got dong hat coming in looking phenomenal on winston and but he's got a ball it's like Every every kind of like caveat that you want to throw at any of these players, they have like evidence to support that like they can probably transition really, really well. But to, to your point, Cus, it's like, OK, what does that look like? Like, where are we in the hierarchy of things? We could probably comfortably guess that you'll be at the top, but like by what degree, you know, so especially definitely. if we go into like a Ramatra May kind of sure. setup, like the meta sort of is pointing us in that direction, like mm. Brawl has always been the great equalizer in a lot of ways of like, it's very hard to have that massive level of domination and control over other teams when you're playing like a Brawl meta. Um, so that could shake them up. Like I, we know Stalker's mm -hmm. a great May. I'm sure Hawk can play Ramatra. You know, Fielder can play whatever he wants. Same thing with Chio. So like, I'm sure they'll be just fine, but I think there's going to be a lot of teams that will come out of the woodwork to compete with these guys. I feel like Ryan would be even a bigger issue potentially. For yeah, them. Ryan's yeah, Ryan's like the 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 one that you hope you don't roll. But even then, it's like of all the tank heroes, like if we have like a what, however many ten sided die, and you just have to like hope you don't roll one, you know, one in ten. Like those are some side. Those are great odds. Like yeah, it's yeah. a well built team. And then even yeah. and I kind of just wrote about this where it's like okay, you know, looking at the playoffs, looking at like this new mode that's being added in Flashpoint, which we got some news about. And we'll talk about. And then to know that, you know, there probably will likely be this new support hero. It's like, yeah, we have Chio and Fielder and Fielder just got off an absolute MVP performance, stunning the Houston Outlaws, I think, in every any possible turn. But it's like, we can't forget about Vigilante. It's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. you yeah. can't miss, bro. Like every time you think like, oh, no, no, we just get the Rhine and then we'll get him on Flashpoint in this new hero. It's like okay i guess there's vigilante now like wh what do you do this team's f crazy like it's nuts by the way can i be an insensitive asshole and ask um, maybe very insensitive question <laughs> did he cry right, because great. he didn't have much play time or did he cry because he really loved winning that he probably enjoyed the like he was, you know, hanging winning with the, the homies and winning yeah, the, baby, uh, participation yeah. the baby uh, participation trophy. <laughs> I'm an Overwatch League champion, guys. Okay, fuck it. He's carried his ring around. I don't know. Like, I agree. Like, I don't think it's because he didn't play. I, no. I really hope it isn't like because he played one map in the whole yeah. midseason Madness playoffs, I think. And I think that was the one that they lost to the Houston Outlaws in the mm. series that we casted because he came in to be like that pocket zen on New uh, Queen yeah, Street. Yeah, yeah. But I don't know. Like, you know, it, it always feels bad because like you are a part of the team and you you are like, you know, Phil. Yeah. So like, I hope it's not because of regrets and stuff like that. You could see it on Hawk's face and in his interview, right? Yeah. When <laughs> he, he did that, was, he was like, I wish I won my map. This would feel a lot yeah. smoother if yeah. I got mine, right? Yeah. Like, yeah. Yeah, no. It's, I know. A little it's bittersweet. Fair. Especially, like, because I think, like, for a long time, if you think back, it always felt like it was a little bit like Hawk and Gator's team, right? And how oh, this yeah, for sure. team was ran. I think this is clearly not Hawk's team anymore, at least in this meta. Yeah. And that, like, it, it, it must feel different. I think, like, if you've been here three and a half years, you did just take that shit to the bank, though. <laughs> like, yeah, yeah. Like, I got those checks. You're like, fuck it, why not? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I helped. I helped us get here. Like, I was diva on those first couple weeks. Like, well, you know, we're yeah. mixing it up. They like, were playing the I didn't shit maybe end, but well. yeah, whatever. Yeah, I yeah, know exactly. Um, so it's like you know, I don't think anybody should be hanging their head low, and I, I think vigilante will get get a come up real soon. If I had, yeah, to, I don't if think I had to that bet. was it, right? I think yeah, that was also just like. You know, came from the Washington Gulag, and now I'm here. Um, yeah. So, mm -hmm. so no. Fair Always enough. remember where you came from. You know, you <laughs> yeah, didn't play, but you could, it could yep. be worse. You could be on Washington again. So mm -hmm. <laughs> that is so very true. I want to throw this your way, Custa, and I think that Yiska would agree, but I'll, I'll leave some room for some disagreements. Um, should we view the midseason madness as more of a major title? Should should that be almost like side by side with like the the world championship? Uh, I think is it? if you ask me about last year's format, yes. 
okay. because I think it was a marathon seven day event where teams went through this huge uh, double sided bracket, uh, sorry, double limb bracket. And mm. like we saw storylines, all the best teams were there. You can't argue that by any ways. And the meta was good, right? Mm -hmm. But this one, it was a three day event. <clears throat> we only had six teams. Yes, everyone qualified. It was probably the six best teams, but I don't know. It, it just, it felt so short. Like okay. it, it, I don't think you can hold it to the same standards as winning the playoffs at the end of the year, which I hope is a much bigger spectacle. You're chasing that sure. shit so hard right now. I was about to say four-man no, so playoffs. <laughs> to APEC, to NA. We're meeting at yeah, Costco. Like, like. <laughs> I don't know. I, I have to hope. I have to believe it'll be yes. good. Yeah. No, I, I, I mean, so, so. you know, we got the majority of the teams here. I would have to assume that, like, it should be, you know, at least a little bit bigger. Yeah. You know, longer. If we can get to like, I don't know. If we can get to like ten or twelve, in my opinion, okay. I think that would make it. That would make it a spectacle. You do like you almost do a twelve with like you know first round buy for the first like top four teams, sure. and sure. then you have like the contenders, a, a Eastern Region contenders teams can qualify if they like deserve to qualify and mm -hmm. stuff like that. I I, I think it'd be interesting because like I think everybody can agree the midseason madness would have been better if we had one more APAC team and one more West team. Like if we had yep. the Gladiators yes. come. And yep. we had a Guangzhou charge or Dreamers. You know, Dreamers sure, deserve to sure. be here on O2 Blast. Like, that would have made the event that much longer and feel that much more special. And I don't think it would have added as much. Like, add one more day to the event. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. I, I hear that. What did you guys think, it's... think about the, the uh, broadcast time? Was that optimal, generally? I, I mean, like, they probably the time optimized... It started? Yeah, they probably optimize based on like their viewership metrics and whatnot, and like also availability. But like, uh, that was a roughie for Europeans once again. Oh yeah, I I always yeah. feel terrible like when when you have like a Western broadcast and some Europeans like it's four a.m. for me. It's like oh yeah, they started know how that feels. Local. But yeah, yeah, I think it's been a consistent uh, theme throughout the life of Overwatch League that Europeans don't really count in the yeah. in the consideration <laughs> of when we're doing things. Look, at least the first games usually start at nine local, right? True, like, yeah, not three thirty. Like at least you can catch one. And especially like I, I felt I was like announcement Korea. Yes, those are like at ten a.m. in the morning. Mm -hmm. We are starting way earlier. No, like, <laughs> yeah. this, it was it was really rough. But um, yeah, no, I I think that's probably also. Are you really going to go to a venue, drink beverages, and Koreans drink a lot of alcohol? at 10 a.m. in the morning and get yeah. like fired up there it probably impacted the uh the mood a little bit as well i would imagine like it, it wasn't a korean event with the way that it was run for that exact reason mm -hmm. right like it yeah. started the event started the opening ceremony happened at 10 a.m on a friday <laughs> like who has time to go to that and it's the like kids it's are still also, in school that's it like uh, people that you want to be there family everyone yeah. they just have work like you know that's just the way it is and the venue also wasn't in prime location you know daddy was saying it's yes. about a 40 minute train ride or way out to oh geez yeah of seoul so it's like it is a little bit out of the way and that's so that all adds up and that's why the crowd was so small mm. to begin with so you know that's what you got to do if you're a western primarily built yeah. league but it's like we're an international league that's built for the west which kind of feels weird to, to be Love fair it. to not shit on the league too much the kintex where it, take, it took place they also already hosted like lck finals in that so it's not like they just yeah. took oh, some no, it's not a outside. bad venue yeah yeah, yeah. Venue, venue, right? like yeah, it, yeah. it very much has a history of hosting esports as well, events as well i think it's mostly the time zone not necessarily the location as yeah. much um that that happened it's also like realistically at 10 a.m. You're getting probably like a couple of students. I remember like in the Apex era. Do you remember when they held up the they like they held up the fan art, not primarily just to show their support, but also to hide their faces. Yeah, yeah. As yeah, like yeah. I can't. <laughs> yeah, I'm supposed to be in school. Please don't. Yeah. Please don't come <laughs> for me. Don't look at me. Don't look at me. <laughs> and uh, also, don't, don't, I, I don't want it to be twisted. Or like I, I think this was the best decision that the league could yes. do to do it at this time. If we did it. At let's say we started at noon or one p.m. Korean time, that starts at you know midnight Ungodly Eastern time. Hours, the yeah. the viewership on the YouTube would have been awful, which yep. yeah, and everything would have been poor. Mm. So it is the best of a bad situation, I think, 100%. when you do these kind of global leagues. What, what? there's not like a, a a super supreme you know ideal situation, but yeah, it's probably best to 
again the metrics i think here the, the i guess we can weigh up the utility okay and i think it's fair to say that we probably have a little bit of le less resources this year than we had even last year or the year before mm -hmm. but sure. this of course has to be weighed against our hawaii options right so yeah yeah do you rather have this and only one tournament in the middle or would you rather have had hawaii and then three tournaments again i I guess my answer is uh, is is just going to be the classic like Reddit or Twitter answer. It's like, why don't we just have more tournaments overall? And like <laughs> everything is golden and great. Um, because like I think realistically, if I'm being honest, it's hard to come up with an answer for either of those two options. Because I think if we're trying to be a global, you mm. know, big esport, you need to do more than both of those options. In my opinion, I think like you know we were talking about this. Um, I was talking about this on stream. If, if you had two major tournaments like this and then the playoffs, I think that would be enough. Like you had two yeah. midseason madnesses and then you had a playoff at the very end and then you lined all that up with the seasons. I think that would be enough. And I think people would be happy. And that's a great place <laughs> to go from. It's also not great that as soon as that those games finished, I'm directly jumping over to Valorant and now I my like my my frontal lobe is still still has the imagery of the uh, Overwatch stream up, and now I'm contrasting against Valorant. It's not a yeah. not a comparison you want to set yourself up for, right? Like we're not gonna win against <laughs> Valorant, no, right? No, like they, sadly I, not. I went to their uh, the open for that uh, for VCT okay. Japan because uh, I did my honeymoon out in Japan, so we went mm. to the first day, and like they just. The re the realistic thing is they just have more money and like yeah, they yeah. are they they are where we were you know back in 2018 2019 yes, when we yes. were like we can do anything we can create these awesome things we can do these big events and you know they're going through that right now and it's awesome to see and like as much as I'm jealous I just love to see esports doing well yes, I love watching VCT Japan mm -hmm. like they, Tokyo they've been doing a phenomenal job I love watching like the production quality, everything that they do. So, you know, it's awesome to see, but I agree. Then you, then we go do our jobs at Overwatch League and you're like, oh man, this yeah. feels kind of bad at times. Yeah. Look, the, the way, and I don't want to talk too much about Valorant uh, because a lot of people probably can't really, you know, connect with that. But there was a team in Valorant, EDG, who were mm. a Chinese orc. That game hasn't mm. been, has been out just for a year. And they have a really cool storyline. It got super far, way further than anyone thought. And then mm. they also had like this star player kid that's just a straight baller and just like pulled all kinds of showmanship on the stage. But the vibe also in, in, in all that production and whatnot, it actually reminded me a little bit of Chengdu Hunters. Um, mm, yeah. Right? Like just this Chinese like team that... You know, people under uh, underrate. Of course, Chengdu Hunters in season two also not super successful, but they no. did something different, and th that's what EG EDG did, did as well, right? Like they um, were re uh, really in uh, innovative on strategy, and also like had h way higher kill share from that kid just popping up on the mm -hmm. operator and whatnot. They had just really like put me into that mood again uh, and once again that contrast <laughs> this week i'm whiplashing the entire week basically right like so but yeah no but i, I agree uh, like it's it's great to especially in this moment in time to see esports do well as 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 yeah. weird as that sounds but like the announcement that they got mastercard uh as a sponsor on board mm. also like made me happy because at least someone's putting money here you know yeah um 100 so yeah may maybe we're we're probably not past the worst in terms of like layoffs and whatnot in the industry but maybe we're you know looking upwards and um yeah i mean the, as overwatch we're probably going to have to deal with a little bit it's going to probably become a little bit worse until it gets better but um, probably but like the the idea there at least the, what i'm kind of parsing through that is that like Rising tide lifts all boats, right? Like if we're going to talk about like the esports winter, yes, it sucks a little less when we get like that that extra meal from Mastercard, and we see that like people are you know still eager to at least invest at something, right? And that's great to hear, even in our neck of the woods where yeah, it's it's tough, right? Like it's I don't think we're 
mincing words when it's like, yeah, we're going to have to figure out what the end of the year looks like and, you know, what else happens. Obviously, you know, you reported and it was, you know, announced publicly that the Chengdu Hunters obviously exiting the league and that's uh, breaks my heart a little bit. But, you know, what can you do? It's, it's business, yeah. as uh, as they say. So it's, you know, what are you going to do? I, I'm... I'm looking at this whole thing with a more of a glass half full because for me, as someone who was heavily able to enjoy the glory years of what this format was, right? In 2018, sure, 2019, yeah. that was the good time. But I think over the last few years that we've all realized that what we're currently doing doesn't work, right? Mm. Like, it, it, you know, this global model and what they tried to do with this franchising doesn't work. I'm hoping that... You know, the changes with, you know, the Toronto um, collective bargaining deal that ended up coming through where they uh, forgave a bunch of the fees. And then, you know, Chengdu Hunter stepping down. Looks like gladiators are on the way out with the, the yep. guard and Kroki money coming out. Like, I'm hoping that this can lead to a reset in Overwatch esports to something that's more sustainable and something that's more built for Overwatch in the community that it wants to be. And I think as much as, as you said... There's going to be a shrinking. Everyone's probably, it's going to be a dark winter, but hopefully it leads to something better in the long term. I will say, here's my silver lining. I, maybe that's me like just being pessimistic generally, but I feel like over the last couple of weeks, I learned that less teams want out than I initially assumed. Really? That's and I, th I feel like a little bit, the like... If you were to go out, would you do anything with your roster at this point? Probably not. Probably not. What do you have, right. have to gain? You go cynically, them? you know, you approach it as just another expenditure on the books, and you're like, oh, yeah, great, yeah. I mean, another, you know, those that, that the are not doing anything, yeah, that signals to me you're yes. about, right? Yeah. Now, those that do, why would you do that? Yeah. Right? Yeah. So that, that has been interesting. At least that's my inference from their moves. Otherwise... Like I don't. What are you going to do? Like, there's probably not. Like, maybe you want to keep the franchise value if there's even any or slots left, or we don't know anything what's happening. But they, yeah, like it takes a lot of creative reasoning to come up with a scenario where it makes sense to reinvest in your team unless you want to stick around, right? Yeah. yeah. So, um, yeah. No, I think. Uh, that's that's sort of the the way going forward. Even though I have no clear vision of what that might entail, really don't. Mm. And um, the yeah, the bottom line in terms of um the hunters, the messaging was a little weird here, right? Like it felt like there was still the door being held open for them to come at back. least in. Initially, but yeah. the initial announcement that like they weren't going to be a part of like the initial half of the season, it, it was very clear. Like, hey, we're going to leave the door open. We'll see. But like, I don't know. Call me cynical, but I was like, yeah, no, they're not coming back. <laughs> like, it's it's dead boys. Yeah, it, it, they're like the thing about it is it's not even like Chengdu Hunters. The reason where it's so easy to be cynical and just never expect them to come back is like they're just, yeah. just their parent company is just yeah they're just poor in the in the to in the in the drain like they yeah. I don't know if they're officially bankrupt or anything but like the reason the only reason they bought him is because they had so much money to spend right mm. and then as soon as that dries up all of a sudden you can't justify yeah. paying this Overwatch League spot doing everything to do with that so you know it's sad to see the Chengdu Hunters go as mm -hmm. you said they were a very unique team in the league that created a lot of great memories. Um, but you know, yeah. who you know, one of those dominoes that everyone expected to fall. Yeah, yep. Ah, uh, so Do you unfortunately, in the winter that is. You where played we sit. them, right? Yeah, I played against Chengdu Hunters. The scariest shit to play against um, <laughs> because uh, I we played them in 2019, right? And mm. uh, this was when they were playing Wrecking Ball yep. to beat goats. And I'll never forget one of our matches going into it against them because you get the starting lineup like 30 minutes before. And we were kind of nervous because you don't, it's like the, the Shanghai 2019. It's like, you don't know how to practice. You can't practice against wrecking ball to yeah. counter goats. And it can work if you don't deal with it correctly. So we were nervous going up against them. And then uh, we got the early roster and they were playing uh, Karyan who was their, their Reinhardt player in Goats. Mm -hmm. And we're like, oh, they're going to play Goats. Oh, thank God. We're just going to beat them easily. That's that's great because they're not like, 
they were a wrecking ball team who couldn't play goats. Yep. And so like it's funny when you have these kind of teams like that who are just every now and then they'll throw a curveball at you and you have to just like work that out. Um so that that was what made them special. They did it with the wrecking ball, they did it with the Jim Moo So it's did, true. Did you even scrim them at the time or was it just like ah oh, that's a waste of time? Well, we, I, the reason we were so nervous going into that match is we scrimmed them a couple of weeks earlier um, because, you know, you need to. And they were playing Wrecking Ball. And we, I, it was a pretty even scrim of mm. them playing the Wrecking Ball. But after we played them, we were like, well, we're never scrimming them again because that's like, <laughs> it's just not effective practice oh, against course. anyone else. That's, the, you know, the, you, people have talked about it in the past, yeah, of like scrim yeah. metas and who scrims who. The reason these teams struggle to get scrims is because it's just not effective practice for anyone else to play against that. And you're not going to play that team in scrims with the anticipation that you're going to play them in a match in a month because mm -hmm. so many things can change between here and then. Yeah, it's more it's more like it, it's better use of your time to you know scrim the other teams that are running what everybody else is running except the weird you know random sheepish team that wants to run Torben. Yeah, you all unfair. All that weird know. stuff. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> It's uh, it, it's always interesting to hear you know those stories come out where it's just like oh yeah this team's getting blacklisted by this team because they're running Brian hard crazy man yeah yeah exactly right like it's it's not always that deep like some people are always yeah. like oh they're not doing this because of this and then this is like yeah, it's not always like, that deep maybe they no. just don't want to scrim them because like yeah. it's also frustrating to scrim sure. against a team who does that like it feels like you're wasting time and especially if you start losing to it you're like well why are we Oof. losing to this like yes. you're just you're hurting team morale you're hurting the frustrations mm -hmm. and you're never really gonna face this again so yep. that's the point why are we even here yeah and your then your dps quits the lobby and then you have to hold the team meeting it's just like come on guys. that's one of my favorite things about like fan sentiment looking into scrims like sure. i feel like a lot of these people forget that there's a lot of like 18 to <laughs> yep, 21 yep, year yep. old egos mm -hmm. in, in these kind of things mm -hmm. and like Players don't always show up and be the best professionals no. all the time. Like maybe it's gotten better since I've left. I I'm doubt sure. It. I At least doubt a little it. bit. Because these are kids that like just they haven't. They, like it, these kids tilt. These you know everyone gets mm -hmm. frustrated. Everyone deals with it in different ways. Some people blow up. Some people get really quiet. Some people rage out of the lobby. Right? Like yep. it's happened throughout the history of time. Yeah, it's not just us. As much as you know, hello, new esports fans, welcome to Overwatch. But you know, a lot of people just quit scrims and. All games, I promise. I promise that everybody is, uh, as much as everybody is uh, winning 100% of their scrims all the time, they're also leaving their scrims 100% of the time. So it's not not just our grass. Let's let's keep it. Let's get it straight. Um. So yes, Chengdu. Sad to see him go. Another knock on effect to to tack on with Chengdu. It's just one less, you know, home for Chinese players. Obviously, yeah, they can't really have a home because Overwatch is like unplayable there still. For my knowledge yeah. which is so hopefully sucks, getting fixed in ideally, the future right like you have to, to you have to imagine that there is going to be some reparation there mm -hmm. i don't know if that's just some crazy amount of hopium coming from my direction <laughs> but like there's no way that blizzard just doesn't run within china for yeah. ever right yeah i think for at least from my very very loose understanding um i think it's about like finding a distributor having that go through government checks and balances and then getting that on the books, which apparently takes like some considerable time. Cause obviously, you know, uh, a, a loose comparison, obviously Valorant, you know, took forever for Valorant to finally get to, you know, mainland China. Just coming was, out now, right? Like, exactly. It's been out right. since 28, uh, 2020. So mm -hmm. like. yeah, it, it took a while for that to kind of get online. So uh, yeah, I, I'm sure it has to be repaired. Obviously, you know, the population that plays Overwatch, that plays any kind of blizzard title is ginormous in, in China. So it's, they got, you know, they're they're going to want to get that money, so they're going to have to figure out something eventually. It's just going to take a little bit of time. Um, but yeah, one less one less home for Chinese talent, at least as it stands today. Um, that could change in the future. We don't know. You know, Valiant exists and they've done weirder things. They could things. always go back to China. <laughs> <laughs> I've seen weirder things in this esports, so who knows? Who knows? Um, so that kind of sucks, especially when you have you know some talent. Uh, some of the the more memorable talent like Amang and Jinmu like you said you know coming up and just just being real fan favorites because they're just kind of kind of goofy as much as I've always been like oh you know Chengdu Hunters they can't escape the goofy crazy meta team you know what are they gonna do yeah zone but you know it's true like we watch them because they're fun they just kind of do dumb shit yeah to be fair like um, <clears throat> I wrote a piece today just like 
you know, an obituary of the Chengdu Hunters. I feel like <clears throat> what the actual thing that people fell in love with was probably ju mostly their season two performance. Yeah. Because, like, it really felt like season four and season two Chengdu Hunters are very different teams, right? Mm -hmm. Yes, they're still playing the ball, but it's very different when you're playing the meta comp, right? You're not the cool yep. outsider that like goes against the grain and tries to you know snipe some uh, victories off of weaker teams, but you're actually trying to win grand finals because weirdly this you know kid that was pudgy in high school grew <laughs> up you, you know also really like yo-yos ball and then <laughs> like it just okay. randomly Analogy. becomes cool to play that right wait what yeah. what joel ball <laughs> yo-yo is that not like <laughs> i mean <laughs> it, it fits but I, it was just not something that you expect you're just like yeah we're talking about this glow up of this team and they like yo-yos and i'm like yeah. <laughs> yo <laughs> all right this, i mean i get the parallel this, but... direction uh, yeah, yeah. This, this is what I'm <laughs> yeah just imagine like the you know the loner kid that's just like in, in part, some part of the school yeah just playing yo-yo yeah. and suddenly it breaks out and he's like oh my god i practiced all my life for this and then you know it's it just that that feel felt, felt very different. Also, I mean, Leaf joining the Source guys is, is transformational, right? Like, uh, yeah, I mean, that was kind of the prince that was promised, right? Like that was the kid that was kind of come up. I think everybody kind of got the first the globe. We got the first glimpse of him at you know the World Cup. You know, doing big things with Team China, and you know, it's like, all right, well, where are you gonna go? Are you gonna go to like Team China's team? Chung do hunters you're gonna go to like some of these you know big paying jobs and it felt right and you know obviously didn't start his rookie debut wasn't fantastic it was a little lackluster but obviously came out i think what was that 2021 yeah i think so right um looks fantastic obviously right? was it 2020 i think so Twenty one mvp uh no, leave 2020 leave one mvp in 2021 okay yes but he debuted and he debuted in 2020, 2020. it was not great yeah, because we were super hype on him from 2019 yes. World Cup, remember? Yes. And we were yes. like, when he makes it to the league, he's going to be insane. And then I think kind was of Chengdu wasn't. really bad in 2020? They, they were, were horrible, but they were not great. And this yeah. kid he also, wasn't also Vin. Yeah, he just came back from PUBG, if you remember. Um, True, oh, yes. It was oh, a year off. Yeah, forgot about that, yeah. Yep. So. Good old MY. That but kid yeah. also has just... My God, develop a better taste to join viable esports, mate. Like Jesus, yeah. <laughs> from wood chipper to wood chipper, <laughs> Jesus. What are you gonna do? Well, you know. Speaking of, obviously, Spark doing well. Leave still looking solid. Was that you know from the broadcast end? You know, take us into that you know moment where it's like, all right, Florida Spark. This yeah. should be kind of one-sided, and it just wasn't. Was that really catching off you guys off guard, or what was going on there? Well, it's interesting because this is really when, like, the full narrative of, like, is a, like, you know, we got Avril on one mm -hmm. side yelling at people, like, Apex <laughs> super sick, yeah, you yeah, guys yeah. don't even know, and then everyone's like, I don't think they're that good. And then it's like, it's going back and forth, and sure. then, like, Spark won. And everyone, and, you know, you can see like all the APAC, you know, bros like pumping their fists, like we did it. We're gonna, we're gonna do something in this midseason madness. And little did they know that was the only win they were gonna get in that yeah. whole tournament, right? And like, I don't know, Spark are a good team. I think it was interesting because we always attributed a lot of their weird stuff to, you know, Changoon, and we called mm -hmm. it the Changoon effect. But sure, I think at the end of the day, there's just. Their level of coordination just isn't as high as yeah. like the top end teams. Even though they have the mechanics to be able to pull it off, um, their coordination isn't that high. And I think one of the primary reasons that you saw the Spark actually get over the Florida Mayhem in that series was because Monk and Lynx had a really good game. Mm. And I think that was something that a lot of people were looking at as, is this the pain point of the Spark? Because we know how great the other three players are. We know how effective their dive is going to be. But if Monk and Lynxa can play this well throughout the midseason madness, how good are they going to be? Um, but just like that one win, that was the last time that we really saw Monk and Lynxa be able to hold their own against some of the top tier dives. Um, and yeah, it, I don't know. Spark could just... I, I, we, were, we were all hoping that we'd see Shy and Leave just come into the league and dominate. Yeah. Maybe we'll see that if the meta shifts into a more... Uh, I would say 
mechanically intensive meta for the sure. DPS players. Sure. Less because you know, obviously we have a tracer, but Sombra is more. Uh, it's about effective dives. Setup. It's about coordination. Yeah. It's about teamwork. And I don't think that's where the spark are at their strongest. So, you know, I feel like they haven't lived up to their potential. I had them at third, I think, in my power rankings, second in my power rankings for mm. this year, and they're just nowhere close to that yet. Mm. Yeah, they're a punchy team. They, like you said, they've got it. They've got mechanics for days. Um, and to you know, kind of underline that point about like Monk and Lanksa, where it's like I think it's a kind of a a little bit of a, a a bad memory of remembering like their head to head with the Infernal. I think week one, week two, somewhere in there. Um, where it's like, yeah, I don't know about this Lynx a guy on the brig. Like, seen him in the past. Like, Lucio's okay. Like, he's all right. But this brig's a little, a little rough. And yeah, the, everybody looked quite, quite fantastic in that that Florida head to head. Um, and kind of you know circles back to what you were talking about previously, where it's like, yeah, Florida, not you know. If you are going to, you know, beat up on a team, it's probably going to be the team that also doesn't want to play the dive all the time. They want to get yeah. away from the Sombra. They want to put Merit on, you know, some comfort picks. So makes sense. Also, makes sense. Also, like, real talk, it, like, this tournament also drove home that Ray probably picked the wrong backline to choose. If you have Carte Blanche and mm. you can pick all of China, then yeah. I'm pe- ta- taking the charge backline. Just plug and play that yeah. shit in. Like, Leaf was playing out of his mind. He's, like, once again, like, one of the best uh, players in the world. I think, like, that team could could have way more potential if you got that backline instead. Like, Veltal, uh, yes, I understand why you probably don't bring him along, uh, depending on, like, what the interpersonal relationship was like in the past that pretty publicly blew up. But uh, I don't know. Like, if if Shock can't, can't run it back bring Spr- striker in and like yeah. when, like th- you can bring it back and become the strongest team in apac it feels like yeah i i, I feel like i don't know how i feel but i think farway and monk are pretty equivalent but i agree i yeah. think xerneas overall uh has shown that he is just the better main support yeah. he's been in bigger games he's had that match and as you said uh yiska like obviously there's that relationship which they said this year that like it isn't you know, they, they're on good terms. It's not yep. a big deal. Like, it doesn't need to be blown out. But if you have an option between two main support players and one you've had a history with that yeah. wasn't always positive, regardless if you've buried that hatchet, you're going to go with the other guy, yeah. right? Like, you're going to go with someone that you think is going to be, you know, a sure thing in a way. And Lynxa has a good history and he yeah, is a good player. But the question that, you know, is starting to come up now is, can Lynxa be a championship player? Can he yeah. hang with the big boys? And it feels like not always. And that's a problem that they're running into. It is. It, it definitely, if there is a weak point, and again, you, when you list out a, a list of players, like one of them has to be, you know, the worst on the team, as much as maybe everybody's great. Um, you know, somebody kind of has to be maybe the bench rider, or, you know, just a a pain point, let's say, to use that. Um, but I... I not and this isn't to say that we are dogpiling him, but to avoid the 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 Timmy's dogpiling, I think to take something that you said, Custa, it does feel like the teamwork just yeah. really isn't there. And that was something that we saw in a lot of their qualifying matches. You go, you know, I brought up the infernal head to head that they played. Gush is constantly purpled, and that's something that we saw, I think, quite exemplified in the final and leading up to it i thought fielder was just and i mean to be fair boston was also twilight doing big things with with anna like the level of performance that you have to have in every position everybody's on their marks everybody's doing exactly what they need to do and adapting to like just the tiny tiniest resource shifting um it, it just isn't there for the spark and i think like that's if there's a bigger picture problem it's that and like you said, if we do shift to something maybe more hit scan centric or something that these DPS can just really flex on everybody, that's when you're going to see them shine. It's it's really not always the, the the teamwork aspect. It doesn't seem like like you said, it's not it's not there just yet. I also think this is a, a with the public, you know, as you said, dogpiling. When we're saying Linksa can't hang, we're not saying he's a trash player. Yeah, yeah. Like, there's Get a, there's a yeah. There, there's, I feel like people think it's, you know, very black or white, like polarizing mm-hmm. of, should this guy be in the league or shouldn't this guy be in the league? It's like, no, there's a there's many tiers within the league of yes. like how good is a player. Like Linksa, 100% deserves to be in this league. He's, mm-hmm. he's probably middle of the pack in terms of main supports yeah. within the league. 
but that's not going to cut it when we're talking about the nitty gritty at the top end. And yeah. I think that's that's where we're really trying to highlight. A hundred percent. Also, like, we, is like you said, great. championship aspirations. Zonius is just great in comparison, right? He is. He's, probably, he's fantastic. Probably top five, I would say. I I have him on my mount, like mount, my main support Mount Rushmore. I think he's an absolute behemoth. I think he's fantastic. Yeah, I don't know if I'd put him on my rush more. Um, I'm currently in the in the in the league right now, especially main support's been uh it's funnily enough like a very exposed role this year because mm-hmm. I think of how important that brig is in this meta. I think it's really shown like the difference between some of these players. Um so yeah, I, I, I think he's definitely up there because he's a he's a known quantity, and that's I think Xerneas's biggest strength is he's been there, he's played in big games, and he's uh, performed in those big games. Yeah, it's a monster. Stats in the past, like you said, performing well with Chengdu. God rest them. Um, but yeah, no, I have to have to wonder what the what that decision was like with Ray and the Spark. What that looked like. Um, did you expect this the Infernal to do a little bit better? Custa was that? Were we were, were we so down on APAC that it was like, yeah, pack it up. Like they're not getting maps or. If you had to pick, do you think the Spark overperformed and the Soul up, Infernal underperformed? Like, if you had think, to pick one. I, I think Soul Infernal definitely underperformed. I think they okay. are, right, in this meta, I believe that they were a better team than the Hongzhou Spark. Like, yeah. I, I think with their recent performances, you know, I, I was a doubter of Soul Infernal heading into this season. Mm-hmm. But, you know, and I think I it, it took a long time way for me to come back after they lost to the soul dynasty in the first match yeah like i was like this is the issues i expected mm-hmm. from the soul infernal right but then over time they sort of brought my trust back up i was getting closer and closer and i i, I believe in this team and they are a great team mags proving to be a great player skewed mm-hmm. as you said you guys have been saying putting up mvp performances uh just like the spark i think soul infernal run into an issue of if their players aren't able to just out mechanic and just pop off at the same level, I don't think their coordination is there. And I think yeah. Zest and MN3 got exposed when they were going up against equivalent level of players. They weren't able to get into the back line, do as much. You know, they just they just weren't able to perform in the way that they have in APAC. So yeah. they're they're a great team, but I would have liked to have seen them take a match. I think they should beat, you know, a Florida Mayhem or a Boston Uprising. Mm-hmm. And I think they'll be kicking themselves that they didn't. I think if we, you know, we simulated a few different times, I, don't, I, I think there's quite a few, you know, Doctor Strange universes where, you know, Infernal probably are look very competitive with yeah. those those mid mid tier, I, I not mid tier like the you know Boston Florida's. That's mm-hmm. a better way to put it. Very competitive, I'd say. Yeah, I, bad day at the office. It feels like. I actually talked to someone in an interview beforehand, and he said like he watches a lot of APAC, and he felt mm-hmm. like in, Infernal were the only team that gets some of the details right on these comps. Mm. And like, I, I believe that also the infernal, I, honestly, this is also not just, just not their greatest meta that they could hit. Right. Like you won an yeah. MN3 on hard hit scan heroes. Right. Like you won to zest arguably like on some Genji stuff or something. Right. Like that's, Maybe. that's where like <clears throat> this team has big performance. Matt can play whatever. I think the back line is also pretty good. I think it is kind of weird that you got to pull skewed off the brig, right? Like, yeah. <laughs> because of how yeah. things fell. But, um, yeah, I, I mean, this is a small roster. Like, there's only so much you can do in, in order of flexibility. It's very different having five players than having seven, you know, like Atlanta. Mm-hmm. So, um, yeah, I think, I personally, I, I just, like, I way over hope him. I had them winning the first match uh, against yeah. Houston. Um, well, just because of, that one, like... Yeah, but yeah, I, I felt like if they can really get like quality scrim time in, and then also they presumably and correctly would have assumed to meet Houston in their first match. Yeah, you just don't scrim them much, right? Like, yeah, and then hopefully you can can find some value there. Unfortunately, blow out, right? Like, yeah. I, mm. like I also locked in before I received my scrim bucks, and immediately, you know, mm. went like, ooh, n- really? Like a miss, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and then, yeah. I mean, fair enough. I, once again, it, I, I think like hardware is there, software yeah. needs updates. I think if they go to a meta where M and three and Zest can play their own game, I feel like that team is going to struggle anytime you need that fully coordinated dive. I'm not yeah. saying they're yeah. bad at it, 
but I just think that's there's going to be a limitation. If you can let Zest just play his own game on like Trace or, or Genji, and then MN3 is able to sit back and like play hits again, that's when they're going to be at their best. And I think that is where you'll see Soul Infernal really start to like punch upwards. But mm. with this level of coordination, MN3 having to be on the Sombra, I just don't, I don't see it yes. um, right now. Yeah, it yep. feels like the antithetical hero to MN3. What I think yeah, of yeah. MN3, oh, right? Yeah. Like, great. This kid is just a walking aimbot. Like on his best day, he <laughs> just has ten ten mechanics, right? Um, so, yeah, I, I don't know. Like, this is, but, but fair enough. Like, you can, you can only do so much with what you're dealt. Of course, I th also think like they could have played a little bit, but more of their style. But also, Houston Outlaws just great team, right? Like. It, it, yeah. It's kind of nuts to think of the Houston Outlaws. Like, if the Atlanta Reign would just like wipe from this universe, then mm -hmm. like you'd think, oh my god, this is the super team. Like, no, yeah. nothing like this has ever been assembled. They're just stomping their way through, right? So yeah, yeah. There's there's so many like parallels in like, even traditional sports. I have to imagine that this you know fits as well, um, where it's like. If only you were born in a different time, that you would be, you know, one of the best, if not like the, a world champion. But because you have to face an absolute freak of nature, super team accidentally built, you know, you just have to play second fiddle because this team is, you know, taking the, the reins right now. It's what's well, happening in the NBA right now. Like I, okay. you know, like I think you're if you're the Miami Heat and you're Jimmy Butler, this was your best chance probably of winning a ring, right? Like obviously mm. they've made it, you know, made it deep, but like there's the fucking Nuggets right now and yeah. the Jokic, which are just like so far above everyone else. It feels like so. Yep. You know, it, it happens in all games. You know, and yep. it, when you peak batters, right? Like I'm sure there's a lot of people who wish they could have played during my era of you know Overwatch, <laughs> right? Where sure. everything was a lot less solved. It was, you know, a lot of a lot of room to grow for a lot of people, mm -hmm. right? Um, but you don't get away with that anymore, right? Like the, yep. the level of competition is at such a ridiculous level that um, you know it's it's hard when you have a team like the Houston Outlaws forming, and they're not the best team in the world. You're like, what? Like if you yeah. told if you told people this team came together in 2021, like they'd be like, oh, the league's over. Like they're not even yeah, going to yeah. compete. No one's going to compete yet. Yeah. Atlanta Reigns here. Yeah. Mm -hmm. In a Winston meta? What? They didn't yeah. win? Yeah, yeah, in a Winston meta, right? Like, yeah, ridiculous. Of all of all the times. And, and I mean, a lot of the... I feel like a lot of the same parallels that we're talking about um, with the Infernal, I think we can also loosely apply, the, maybe nitpicking, but loosely apply to the Outlaws, where it's like, yeah, it's a Winston meta. It's fantastic. They're probably the only team to kind of have an inkling of that same kind of coordination that the Atlanta Reign, I felt like since the Pro-Am was flexing on people, not as cleanly, but like you you had those moments where it was like, damn, that was a crispy setup. Everybody's just on the same page. It feels effortless. Like it, they just delete the people once the trigger's pulled. Um, and Houston, probably the only team to do it. But there again, it's like, and I've been, I've had my opinion changed on Happy. Don't get me wrong. Um, but it's like, yeah, I can't shake the feeling if we had like a hit scan meta, everything else maybe stays the same and you put happy on like a sojourn or like, a, you know, Cassidy, a Widowmaker. It's like, yeah, maybe this is different. Maybe this, you know, maybe he can flex a little bit because it felt like at times, especially in the final, like he wanted to make that hero play. He wanted to kind of go off and like there was one on Esperanza that I because I watched it this morning. Um, like he's he's trying to like pressure. He's trying to pressure uh, Donghak and. He just like burns recall for like no reason, doesn't get a lot done, and then he can't necessarily follow up on a play because he doesn't have any resources. And it's like, ugh, like it, they're they're so close, and it's just like one or two things off. But then you look at Atlanta's roster, and it's like shit. He still played like really good during that. He didn't play right? poorly. I still, I don't know. I I, ha I have like very mixed feelings on like what their DPS lineup for had their role as. You, yes, that's also true. That's yeah. a little weird, right? Like, it it was weird, but it okay. Not to get like too nitty gritty, but it felt like Junk wanted the. It felt like he wanted the tracer throughout like the entire event to be the one to flex. Where it's like, okay, like maybe we want to play Pelly on Echo, so we'll put him on Tracer, and he can kind of do his thing, and Happy will play Sombra. But on like the hit scan maps, we want Happy on Tracer so that he can switch if he wants to, and he can play hit scan or whatever. And like those last couple of games, it's like. 
we're not doing a whole lot of switching. So like, what's going on? It's not like they're playing bad again. Like this isn't a bad thing, but when you're pairing off against the best team in the world by a long shot, yeah. the, like it just, I don't know. It was, it was a little confusing. I, I, at least I th- see something there, but it didn't get leveraged, which is odd. But I think you uh, saw the leveraging in the, in the upper finals when Houston, yes, like yes. you really saw like happy came alive. Like happy was a big, probably one of the best players on the outlaws in that series. Mm. Just he hit very timely pulse bombs. Yeah. It's pretty much the only way that you can dispatch of, you know, the back line of the Atlanta rain is if you're sticking sure. them consistently. And I think that's why the outlaws were so close, right? Like, you know, Outlaws had that full hold on Atlanta Rain on Blizzard World. Mm-hmm. And the only reason that actually happened is because Happy had a 2K pulse bomb when yeah. their backs were against the wall, right? Like that series could look very one-sided. Like we saw what happens when the entirety of Blizzard World gets played out in the grand finals, right? Mm-hmm. So Houston proved that they could match Atlanta Rain, But as you said, it felt like they had to be peaking at the right times. The players yeah. all had to be making the right decisions at the right time where I feel like you know, the Atlanta rain mean is just higher across the yeah. board. So I think Houston can beat Atlanta, but it's like two out of 10 times, three out mm-hmm. of 10 times, maybe, right? Like that, I think it's going to be very few and far between because Atlanta just is that just you slightly roll. better in every single role. You got you to gotta hit them with a crit, you know? Yeah. You got to just gamble the right way. You just got to hope and pray that you just show up on a good day and happy can just hit two Ks and just play gangbusters against, you know, a tough team uh any final thoughts there because i want to throw another one at you guys about this final that i think i think the broadcast definitely picked up on but i'm i'm interested to see a little bit more of a long form take yes any any final points regarding at least just a general outlaws look Mm, i'm i'm a little concerned for their future uh chances like if if this like not not to be too overly critical of that but like their hard carry performances their superstar player carries on winston fearless is good on other picks that he's shown he's not that hard carry on everything else right right so to not win here yes you could have mm. hit a better dps meta is a problem and i will also say and that's probably not a backline gap. I don't think that's true. But interesting. Okay. The the way the ability of that Atlanta backline, and that's more like a system thing. It's not necessarily only down to the players. But sure. especially to stay alive during old pressure was just superior. Mm. Just straight up superior. Like Shu did just didn't look like Shu in that series. Right, yeah. like you know, the playmaking, like sleep the tracer, discharge the situation type of play, rarely happened in this final series, right? And I think Dong Hack got away with a lot for a rookie, right? Yes, yeah. yes, he got a lot of. That was that was what that was kind of like where I was headed with this, anyways. Where it was like you know, the fearless question, where it's like, okay, it was very clear that this kid was getting hated on, he was getting bullied, he was getting hoodwinked, and thrown in lockers like he just had everything thrown at him dying first constantly and it's not like you know oh fearless is a bad player all of a sudden no 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 no. like this is very tailored from atlanta they're trying to pressure him out they're getting him purpled constantly burning the shield fielders playing out of his gore hitting sleeps and it's like okay if it's if it's not like a bad day at the office for fearless which i guess maybe a little column a column b could be um is it just more of a support gap? Is, you know, where where does the buck stop with that head to head? Because it was very clear in that grand final. The upper bracket was a, much closer. I have to give credit there. Um, but that grand final was a little taken a task, let's say, for the outlaws. Where it, it, like you said, Chu just wasn't there. So where where do we think what fell apart for outlaws? Was it more so that Atlanta were playing to kind of focus on fearless so that, you know, Shu didn't have a ton of opportunity to kind of make plays unless he went on like a weird flank, which puts him at risk. You know, like where, where does the buck stop for them? Uh, I think for me, a, a classic misconception is people are like, oh, backline diff or, you know, Winston yeah. diff. But yes, yes. W- when you say Winston diff, the Winstons don't really interact with each other. No. So it's kind of like, that's not really how it works. So I would say it's it's a bit of column A and column B. I think mm. Fearless, 
he went aggressive and he he went for the back line of the Atlanta Reign, which he has to do because right. if you leave them be, they will just take over the game, right? Yes. So mm-hmm. he has to go aggressive. So I think Fearless diff, uh, sorry, Fielder diffed Fearless. I think he yes. was hitting the sleeps. He was baiting him in. But Fearless needs to do that. He needs to do his job. Maybe he could have played better. He could have you know played around his bubbles. But if you've watched Fearless play before, he doesn't make many mistakes. So I would almost assume that it's almost a Fielder thing. Remember, there's a lot of experience between those things. Fielder yeah. might understand how to play around Fearless Winston a lot better because as an Anna, you heal Winston a lot. So mm-hmm. it's like you understand the, the tendencies of that player. So that absolutely could be something. While on the other hand, I think Donghak played very well against a player that we consider to be the best Anna in the world, yeah. right? A lot of people consider that of like, Shu just didn't hit that many sleeps. Donghak was able to play his game. That could be a result of Donghak f- not feeling like he has to do as much as Fearless and just mm-hmm. playing to be disruptive and just you know playing a little bit. It's hard to really know unless you watch from all perspectives and understand, yeah. at, which I just have not done, you know, because we don't really have as much sure, access to the replay course. viewer, right? So it's hard to really know the answer to that question. But I think it's a bit of both columns, and I don't mm-hmm. think you can just put lay blame on the back line or the front line or the Winstons and that kind of stuff. I think Atlanta yeah. played well. Outlaws didn't play well. I'm not even going to say that he played badly. They didn't have the answers to Atlanta. No, not at all. And I think there were moments because I agree. I think it's it's you are being disingenuous if you just go, oh, yeah, Fearless had a bad game or God forbid you're one of the weird people who are like, oh, Fearless actually was terrible and he's always been bad. It's actually everybody else that's been carrying. It's like I think Fearless has been overrated this whole time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. (laughs) Yeah, of course, the hindsight Andy has just come out of the woodwork. Um, The Winston one trick meme I can only imagine is, is just rife. Um, in, in the stroking galleries, uh, but it, like you said, Winston, Winston's don't necessarily interact. Like you said, they they kind of like walk past each other for the most part. It's it's a lot of down to like the Anna head to head, where you know you've got a bubble earlier or later, depending on who it is, how they play. There were a couple times where Atlanta felt a little reactionary to Houston's like tempo. And that was something I think Jessica kind of like accurately pointed out at the very start of the season where like their tempo, their pace was just so, so fast. Um, and it didn't feel like fearless had didn't feel super comfortable kind of reeling it back. And then when they did, as I remember one fight on Esperanza very clearly where it was, it felt much more like paced out. Like they didn't ne- necessarily try to rush things or like try to, you know, get back into the game if you will or like try to like answer one of the the dives um and it felt like there was this out for them where it was just like okay maybe we're playing a little too fast maybe if we slow it down a little bit have give ourselves more time to kind of set up that that sombra engage maybe Pelly has to be a little bit faster there maybe if you slow it down dong hack kind of reads that he picks it up and you know then they go aggressive it's it's hard to tell but yeah i think it was pretty clear like you said uh didn't have uh, much much to answer. It was uh, pretty rough. Yiska? Yeah, th- just to get back on the point of like fe- yeah. fearless and, um, you know, like who diffs who, mm-hmm. it, it illustrates a really hard point with Overwatch analysis because essentially it's like, it's like a dance, right? Like you dance, someone's toe gets stepped on. Is it the yep. person that steps on the toe or is it the guy that doesn't pull the toe back? Or is it the sure. mariachi band that's not playing on beat and therefore nobody's feet move and the old tracking is off, right? And you make <laughs> shit uh, like calls based on the false information that the viewer is never going to see. The, the, the th- thing I see is man clicks on head good. That's, yeah. <laughs> that's the thing that I get to analyze, right? So... Um, yeah, it's it's super hard. Even even if we had replay viewer sh- stuff, I think you almost, in order to get a full view, learn the Kore- need to learn the Korean language and then also mm-hmm. listen to the comms who messed up, right? And that's yeah. that is really different to uh, uh, other competitions or other esports, but also is a beauty. Like it's the problem is we want to talk about the people d- d- X Y Z diffs blah blah blah. If we were to objectively talk about Overwatch, we would say Winston uh, like Houston's Winston was ineffective here for yep. whatever yep. reason, right? And then there's the pilot sitting in there is um 
is fearless, right? And then sometimes mm -hmm. you can definitely say, okay, this is was an individual play. This dude just like keeps juggling out of this world. This is a mechanical outplay. Look at Shy just hitting a triple and whatever. Sure. And then it works, yeah. right? Like that. This is not like coordination, or whatever. Like every, anyone saying, oh, uh, by the way, the the old works out in the way that you can triple ding headshot here, right? Like that's mm -hmm. not how it works, right? So, yeah, it's 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 really hard to have a good understanding of what clearly went wrong. Um, but I will say, like, it really did look like Shu was not having a game like he was having it against Kevster, yeah. for instance, right? Yeah. Uh, just shortly, a couple of weeks before that. So, yeah, I, I think, like, Stalker was in. Yeah, insane. that's one where you can just say that this kid absolutely played out of his mind in comparison to you know i think that's i wouldn't say diff necessarily because it's like i don't know it's fair to you know throw happy under the bus there but like stalker's just a fucking nut this kid's crazy i will also say and here like i'm going to continue talking out of my ass because that's what i love to do <laughs> but i okay i l l looked at that kid during the press conference he's born calm that mm. that kid is cold as ice like, I don't know, there's, there's certain temperaments and players mm. that where you just know, like, yeah, of course, he probably gets nervous and everything, but, like, he's really cool about it. He's not fidgety or whatever, right? Like, yeah. he's, he's just, like, there to kill some opponents and, you know, collect some trophies. And then, you know, it's back to grinding ranked or whatever, sure. right? that's that's all of those guys like you you look mm -hmm. at them and when they play and they're they're very emotionless and like from my experience of playing with people that is a massively huge trait to have for yeah. a esports player because not having that physical effect of being nervous that really does affect you as someone who is very physically nervous whenever like i'm doing these kind of things like mm -hmm. it's important to be able to calm yourself down if you can put yourself in those kind of like zen levels like you know you see these guys you know i, I don't know about you guys but when i play overwatch i'm fucking dodging things that are coming <laughs> my direction as oh, i'm yeah, playing yeah. the game but some people they play the game at a fluid flat motion and yeah. obviously that's going to be better because you're removing a variable from everything but it's mm -hmm. a hard thing to train yourself and some people are just like that and i that's how i feel about chio and filter as well right like chio's like in his interview, I think after the thing is they're like, "Oh, how how nervous are you?" And he's like, "I'm super nervous right now." And I'm looking at him, I'm like, "He doesn't look nervous at all. Yeah. He's he's just he's just <laughs> chilling." Like I, I don't know. Like it, it's those are the people that really make the difference, and those are the guys who mm -hmm. are your MVPs. You look at every MVP yeah. throughout the history of the time of the Overwatch League as well. Just you know to bring it to home, like you know, Jonak, Leave. Um, God, I'm trying to remember who all the fucking look, MVPs were. Look, you know, Sinatra, like all those kind of guys. Mm -hmm. They they. They don't have that kind of like trait that you know they seem to ever get nervous. They thrive in that. Yeah. Like Lip got up, and his facial expression was as if I saw a cute cat picture on Reddit. Okay. <laughs> He's like, "Yeah, that was so nice. It was a great day at the office, guys. All right, I'll see you back at the. I'll see you back Monday." Yeah. Like literally. Yeah. It's, it's just. And it and honestly. They gotta, they gotta get over that. They gotta celebrate this. Give us something. Yeah, yeah. You guys to enjoy something at some <laughs> point, right? <laughs> Please. I mean, I think if you, if if it came down to the wire, I think that that that's gonna bring it out of anybody. Yeah. You know, any any stoic is gonna feel something. You know, when it comes down last fight scenario, it's the last play of the game. You hit the crazy shot. The crowd goes wild. Like something's gonna happen. But unfortunately. Atlanta is just kind of built different, and it was kind of just another game versus Houston. 4-0, thanks, see ya. Ho trophy raise back to the hotel room. Like it, 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 there wasn't a lot there for them to chew on, sadly. Um, and then yeah, you get the I wonder you get the kind of half-hearted. Yay. I wonder if Legend RC put put that as like plus one on the scrim sheet, you know, like just like what? Oh <laughs> the, the final You, you guys know? are playing a map down, go. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> one another I mean, scrim. that's one way to do it. I was on stage, but yeah. Just another scrim. Sure, sure. Yeah. I mean I I feel like I mean Custa, you could probably attribute this like or at least speak on this. Like I feel like that's kind of the mentality you want to approach a lot of games with where it's like, you know, we've we've been here before, it's all practice, like this is just another scrim day. Like don't even the the, the crowd isn't there. 
It's the most common like esports player thing when their team mm. is doing badly. They are always like, "Oh, we just need to play like we do in scrims, right?" Because <laughs> players, certain players do react differently on stage. Some sure, players play sure. better on stage. Some players play worse on stage. You know, some people just like it, it. It affects everyone differently. So it's about just getting everyone into that mentality. Every coach will always say, "Just do what we did in scrims. Just don't yep. overthink it." There's like, there's a reason we practice this way, and that's mm. why like you'll have. Um, you know, I did this on our teams. It's like you'll have scrim blocks where you'll prepare for the scrim block as if it's you're going into a match. Yeah. So everything is calculated. It's not everyone just walking around, sitting down at your desk whenever you want to do it. Like everyone is preparing as if that match is thing. And that's an important thing to get into is like, how am I going to get myself in the mindset to be able to play a match, right? Like what are the things? Because like I'm a huge believer of... Um, having a routine whenever mm -hmm. you're going to play a match. I had my routine. I would go to IHOP. I would drink like three coffees and I would, I had a book that I just wrote everything that I thought I needed to know about this team that I'm going up against everything that we were planning on doing the map pool, everything, all that type of stuff. And that was my routine. And then like, I would do that, go home, do this, get on the bus, go and that kind of stuff. And that's really like adds a lot to removing nerves because sure. you're, you're having that consistency. Right. And like I would work out in the morning as well. Right. So it's like, if players have that, the players that have that, you would see a much better performance in matches than those who just wing it and show up in a lot of uh, respects. Mm -hmm. I feel like the next evolution of that is then to also ha have this ability to stay calm, but still, you know, have this kayfabe, this, you know, shit talk capable that's separated from your c core, you know? Like, you yeah. can shit talk, but it's separate from the games. You're still giving a little bit of something to the audience that they can enjoy. Because let's yeah. be honest, like someone that's just like super regulated and has, never has emotions between like outside the range of four and six on the POG scale and just sits there just like in homeostasis, just going like, I feel zen, you know, like this, this yeah. is not entertainment, unfortunately, right? Like someone that seemed like you could be, uh, could do that pretty well was maybe someone like Super, maybe someone like Bumper, sure, right? Sure. Like those guys we're capable of doing both of those things. And I feel like that's that's the next evolution. And I'll tell you, international players in the biggest esports leagues, they also have to learn this, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Like, I interviewed Faker at MSI. He doesn't have this, but he doesn't no. need to. He's Correct. just like, he just needs to be like the, you know, this icon. And that's fine, mm -hmm. right? He doesn't need to develop anything. But I look at once again Valorant. I can't lie, that Can Can kid just like is entertaining, fun to watch. Yeah. yeah, right. But also ice cold and is constantly top fragging for his team. Like someone that shit talks and backs it up on the server is so valuable to an entertainment product. Holy, one hundred percent, one hundred percent. I actually think this is a massive issue that esports as a whole is going through mm -hmm. in the last five years because, especially with the inclusion of social media and a lot of that kind of stuff, a lot of players. First of all, people want to be like Faker. They're like, I don't sure, care about making a brand. I don't care about doing anything. I'm here to win, right? To but the, the reality is not many people win. Like yeah. there are very few people actually win. So most of those players just end up being boring players that no one ever cares about, right? And then, you know, the, a lot of players don't want to do content anymore. Like they mm -hmm. don't want to build their streams. Yeah, they don't want to do that kind it. of stuff. They're mm -hmm. not building. Yeah, you know, I'm sure you guys deal with this more than anything, right? These people don't want to promote the product and make it fun and make it interesting and that's really hurt esports because i think it's lost a lot of the personality it had in the past yeah. because and that makes it a lot less interesting to watch that's why i used to watch and that's what got me into esports i love watching you know idra on play sure. Starcraft oh, too. Yeah. i love watching Huck. <laughs> okay. what i love that rivalry yeah. Yeah. between those two guys i that got me into esports that got my burning passion of like and then i get to see them play on fucking land like that's the best thing ever right like that's what everyone needs to go to. But I think the things that I've already said, plus the fact, and I think this is the biggest issue for a lot of people, is you get the people that get the most upset of the fans and the fans just take it to a, sure, a ridiculous level that it's not worth being yes. that guy, just talking shit, having fun. Because if you can't back it up, you just get crucified. And yeah. I think a prime example of this in the Overwatch League is Dogman. You know, yeah. Dogman came in. He's a nice guy. Like he's just he just wants to have fun. He wants to mm -hmm. do that band. He wants to go back and forth. But people hated him because yeah. he called Cruz a feeder in a match. Like that's I think the this is never gonna happen, but I think people need to just take it less seriously than it actually yeah. is. 
and enable the players to sort of show some of their personality without feeling like if they lose, people are just going to dogpile on them. Yeah. Yeah. To, yeah. to be fair, there is also something to be said. Like, it's it's the most unfair thing. And that's why, like, I really like what the Boston Uprising did to in reaction to them getting cr public criticism. Yeah. You just take it on the chin and just keep going. You keep pushing. Like, the yeah. part of the entertainment factor for the audience is to be the shitter on Reddit that complains against that. Mm -hmm. And if you, like, the person that can talk the shit, even when they get hit, and the, the audience keeps coming, they keep going. That's the guy that provides the most value, but it's also, you got to be built, built different in order to not be impacted of course. with your per personal performance with this. But those are the guys that we really need. Now, the problem is, it's not just that Dogman got piled on and then Dogman, you know, focused on his game, became quiet and tried to win championships as well. It's that everyone else around uh, Dogman in the Overwatch League sees, I don't want to be that guy. I, I yeah, don't like exactly. where's the value it's not like Dogman now has like the the eternal brand that he like you know he could effortlessly roll into a streaming mm -hmm. career he tried like they, the payoff just feels not there yet but if yep. more people like Dogman kept pushing then this could have been something and a scene that does this pretty well where everyone just constantly keeps firing is Call of Duty Right, comparatively. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. And they keep firing on Slack. They keep firing in internal channels. <laughs> they keep firing amongst each other. Right. But yeah, it's all like a, an agreement, right? It's something that I think like MMA does really well. It's just like, yo, we're here to like sell a fight. Like we want to put butts in seats because it benefits us. But boxing does it as well, where it's just like we're gonna just say some stuff. Obviously, yeah. there's lines, there's boundaries that you just shouldn't cross. Some people do. Mm. You know, you can feel about them the way yeah. you want. Um. But yeah, it's just kind of an agreement that it's just like, you know, whatever happens in the interviews, you know, it's just the interviews, you know, I have a respect for you, you know, we're going to hug it out after we punch each other in the head for 30 minutes. Um, and, you know, you, you figure it out after the fact, but like it benefits everybody. It rises everybody up if this fight's great and the next fight's great. Like it, it, it makes career fans. And that's something that esports desperately needs because those are people who pay. And that's the one thing that if you ask anybody in esports, the one thing that we need is people who pay because we ain't got a lot of that i'll also tell you straight up like the best organization in the overwatch league in terms of providing that particular value is the other terrain like mm -hmm. every one of those interviews it's just they just chat it out if it's gator yeah. if it's hawk they don't like they just keep going <laughs> and that like at least for me like the viewership backs it up like, like it's a sure. five or six x on on views in comparison to everyone mm -hmm. else it's the the amount of information that Gator provided in these interviews just because, like, why not, you know? Yeah. And also, I think maybe this was a little encouraging in comparison. He actually didn't get roasted that hard. No. Okay, he, okay here's, here's my counterpoint to, to that, especially within the Overwatch community, is Gator, those guys are able to come out and talk their shit right now because they are the best fair, like, fair. What, what are people gonna say you know like flame them like they're, they're better than everyone else you can't do that think about you know atlanta two years ago with both mm -hmm. gator and hawk who both just decided well i'm just never going to use social media again because yeah. every time they came out people are just like you're just complaining because you suck these guys are complaining now and they're the best right like that's yeah. the thing it's why reason ryan had disappeared the same thing you know going back to your boston uprising point they probably would have been crucified and that social media manager might have gotten fired mm -hmm. if Boston ended up sucking. Like if they did come through and they were boomed and this team went with under the, you know, Toronto defiant tracks, right? Yep. It wouldn't have been the same, but because Boston is good, it's all just in good banter and the community rallies behind them. And I think that's the problem is that it feels like if you're down, it feels like you're never able to, to be that guy. And I yeah. think that's, and a lot of people are scared of doing that. And that's, I, we need to get out of that. You know, we need to have fun with it. You remember when like Atlanta said, it's not coming home to the London Spitfire and sure, the yeah. internet fucking imploded on itself mm -hmm. when it was just some fun comment that actually had yeah. a lot of relation to what was going on in the world. Cause the world cup was going on. Like, yeah. I think we're just a soft community and you know, Love especially that. when you Love compare that. it to Cup. Yeah. Oh yeah, for sure. Like that, that's a culture of, I mean, you know, there's, there's, you know, endless memes of like, oh, you wouldn't survive in a modern warfare two lobby. Yeah. It's like, it, it's born and bred in, in console gaming. It feels like, yeah. Um, and here we have, you know, it's, it's a little softer, and it's not inherently a bad thing. I think you just have to approach it a little differently. Where it's like, you know, people, 
view maybe like the mayhem of like 2018 a little bit, you know, with with rose tinted glasses where they're doing silly stuff and it's fun and it's affable and they suck, but it's okay because we love them because they they do the fun anime dance and they come out and they're, you know, it's it's different. (laughs) But then people flame them like, why don't you focus on the, you know, practicing and getting good? It's like, how long did you think they were standing in that back room (laughs) thinking about this? This took them 30 seconds. What the fuck are you talking about? Like they're memeing to have fun because they're they're able to play on stage in front of, you know, 100,000 people on a stream and they're living the dream and they're having their best life. And you guys are crucifying them because they're not that good. Like, yeah, but at least they're, you know, they're trying like they're absolutely trying their hardest. Those guys are all great players and they're all trying their hardest to win just because they do a funny walkout doesn't mean they're not taking it seriously Mm -hmm. yeah i think it's it's important to also recognize like when i interviewed faker a thousand interviews were staring back at me maybe more right Mm. same with simple same with device there's a certain coolness just having been asked and also audacious questions sure uh, like that that there's a security some start playing with it right like i remember Mm -hmm. i was i took um i talked to device i'm not sure how the question came to be oh yeah he was talking about like how every time after like long uh, like preparation stretches after a major he just gets sick as the stress falls off and his immune system shuts down and then he just gets sick right and uh, my question was like how are you feeling after this major and he's like yeah this is a weird situation because it had been a while since i've lost one and it like the the way he said it, it was just like <laughs> everyone's just like chuckling to himself because yeah, he had one back to back majors at that point, mm-hmm. right? Yeah, so, yeah. So like a cool as fuck answer to that. And like that you know what interviewing simple, that dude was like, Okay, we have a group interview, okay. Everyone gather around, took a chair, turned it around, set set on it like cowboy style basically, and went like, Okay, questions? You know, like that coolness just comes after t- a thousand interviews sure through, yeah it's right it's and not just new being one of the greats you know everyone's yeah. everyone's here to excited to talk to you right like <laughs> yeah and i feel like if we just got to get there like yes if you're 19 right now those first interviews will stress you the fuck out sure uh, i'm not going to lie right like that's just going to be the case and um i think it's worth getting through like mm. it, for everything this is this is a transferable skill that you take after this right like yeah. you're going to be sitting in interviews your entire life for anything. If it's, you know, for a job, for a date, someone's True. going to ask you life like questions and going to try to measure you and someone will evaluate you and you got to show off your coolness in order to show that you can handle the situation. And yep. um, I think a lot of orcs actually do a pretty great job. Um, mm-hmm. I I just think like, the, it, it would be super cool if more players were open to that uh, experience as well. Of course, like look, I'm of course selfishly arguing right here. I'm aware what I'm currently doing, right? <laughs> but um, I still honestly think like it would benefit the future of this esports a lot if we once again get back to mm. um, a level of not so serious trash talk, right? Yeah. I also think teams need to make their own content, I think has been a huge hole. So players don't have that ability to show their personal. Like when I was a player, we had, you know, I had Custom News Network. We had um, uh, Game of Snacks. Then we had like our own like weekly thing that we did and, you know, sitting down doing an interview. And as you said, it's something that you know, people just aren't good at it. They just do it a lot. And then you eventually get to a point where you're comfortable and you're happy to sit there and talk about anything. And you brought this up earlier, Yisker. It's one of the biggest failures or well it's not even a failure of the league but the very unfortunate that super ended up leaving because i think super was one of the best at it of like he was able to sit down and he will give you good answers he'll give you funny answers he'll give you insight he'll do all that same kind of thing i feel the same way about space and you know everything that happened with him you know regardless like space was also great at interviews he was thing but i remember in 2018 when he first joined the team like I said to him, man, I'm like, hey, man, you want to be as big as I know you want to be. You got to do interviews. You got to do content mm-hmm. because people aren't going to give a shit about you otherwise. You're just going to be hanging on the thread of being successful, right? And if he hadn't done all that content, he hadn't done all those interviews, he hasn't really been super successful as a player and like people wouldn't think of him in that light. So I think there's to a lot of players, if you have the ability to, there are some people who just don't want to do it. Like prime sure. example, 
Shaxx. That guy, he was a great guy. One of the quietest guys I ever know. That man doesn't want to be in content. That man never wants <laughs> to do an interview in his life. And that's okay. But yeah. if you want to be that and you want to be meaningful and you want to have a long-standing career, you need to do that. Yep. I remember... I remember because you're talking about space. I remember there was a Overwatch League press conference, and I knew we had three winners sitting there because it was space, super, and Jake, and yeah. they were just in the press conference. I think, not to exaggerate, I think twenty to twenty-five journalists were still there. So you know when that time was when there was still this much interest in the Overwatch League, and they were just having jokes. Like every, all the journalists were muted but listening, and they were just bantering. Back and forth, you know, like like they would if nobody was watching. Mm -hmm. And yeah. there I knew, okay, like these guys are going to be names, right? Or are already names. And you can see that this confidence at their age is just hard-earned through exposure, right? And like yeah. the art of not giving a fuck. Yep. It's, it's I think, something that you hear... <laughs> Prattled isn't the right word, but it is something that it, it constantly you hope to maybe break through to somebody that like, yeah, the interviews help the branding helps. Like you have to worry about yourself in some ways outside of just the scrim today or like the block tomorrow, like your career is, is yes, player first, but like there is orbiting stuff that you have to do if you want to, you know, work in the space. Like there, there are avenues elsewhere um, in esports that, you know, how many how many players like transition obviously cussed off like i'm it's not lost on me that you're one of them but like you can even go outside of your own initial game where it's like you know you've you've built up transferable skills to go elsewhere and it's like if you don't if you don't do it then you can't try to claim it you know what i mean like it's it's you got to start I have, somewhere uh, yeah i have a lot of people like it, people always ask me it's like what am i going to do after the overwatch league i really enjoy casting and i like maybe i could go to another game but i like i am very aware that i can go do a lot of mm -hmm. other things just because of the name and the resume that i built up yep. from my years right and that's not always possible i think a lot of players sort of run into that issue of like well now that i've stopped playing well now what what, what do i do i, yeah. I don't want to be a coach like, that's not what I, I I'm not feeling that it's like well do I go to collegiate and get a degree and that kind of stuff there mm -hmm. aren't that many like and there are players that like I'm always like I wouldn't know where they are now like a prime one to me is agilities like Brady sure. like a great friend of mine worked played with him for um for a long time haven't talked to the guy haven't heard anything about him in a while he had that streaming contract with Toronto for a bit but mm -hmm. since then it's it's hard to really know where all these people end up Mm -hmm. uh, and you know, there's a lot of players that just sort of fade, and a lot of people don't want to stay in esports and don't sure. want to stay in video games. But you know, there's a lot of great skills that you can learn while still being a player because you get opportunities that you will never get. Yep. Like, that, think about it. We're able to talk to like game developers. If you want to go into game dev, mm -hmm. this is one of the best foots to think. Like, that's something I would love to do. Like, if I ever got an opportunity to become a yeah. game dev because of my experience of being a competitive player and everything that I know, like, I would do that in a heartbeat. Yep. But that's something that you need to work towards. Yeah. It's, it's, I think like not not too far from like Yisko's wheelhouse. I think like somebody who I, I believe works at Activision Blizzard these days. I think Talbotar like famously of like a wow. I'm not you know, sure arena if he pro. still works there, but he did. Work at least there. Yeah. Still, right. A ton of uh, okay. wow players just like went into Hearthstone and whatnot. Right. Like, yeah, of course. Yeah. yeah. Yep. So like, uh, but this is also another thing that this esports needs to get better at with is keep the talent around if you look sure, at yeah. valorant yeah. their ability to be sticky for professional and entertainers to also you know set camp at that particular esport not the game not variety streaming and like play that game 15 percent of the time that game mm -hmm. right that is so much higher than an old watch like we have, it's it's crazy that we just this week hear one of the guys <laughs> sign a one hundred million dollar contract, right? We have sure for we have like, um, like even outside th theoretically, like, uh, what's his name, uh, former Fnatic coach that now streams Rolf with Gator. sure for, yeah, Gator yeah, yeah. was sure for like all these guys are just like outside of Overwatch and doing very yeah. well, right? Super, yeah. so. What are we doing wrong that they don't want to align their brand with esports? Well, okay. I, I, here's, here's my disagreement because I think that's a hard thing to do, to keep people yes. in-house. And I think the only game that's ever been able to do that is League of Legends. There, there mm -hmm. are people who have been doing this for like 10 plus years, yeah. right? Yep. But 
I don't. I think it's way too early for people to be doing comparisons of Valorant to Overwatch because the one thing that Valorant hasn't had to live through yet is a new game coming out that yeah. directly competes with them. Owls yeah. was Fortnite and then Valorant, right? And that's that has led to the death because people just leave and they'll go to the new esport. That happens every time a new primary esport comes out. That is my question for Valorant: is will it live through? a competitor and the test of time. Like Riot can't keep throwing this level of money at it 100% of the time unless they stay not, yeah. at this level. But as people are going to get bored, people are going to move on as soon as something comes out that's more interesting. And yes. I'm excited to see what happens there. Is Valorant truly a generational game that people will be playing for another 15 mm -hmm. years? Or mm -hmm. is it just the flavor of the last few years because it hasn't had that competition? Yeah, check check this podcast out in year five of Valorant Esports and see see where we're at in the timeline of, you know, interest. Like, remember where, like, so Valorant is three years old, right? Mm -hmm. Roughly, Overwatch, yeah. when we were three years old was in 2019 of the Overwatch mm -hmm. League, yeah. right? We were, we were hit. still, we were, we were hitting, we just came out with the announcement of Overwatch 2, BlizzCon, yeah. we were firing, everything was looking great. Yes. People were like, Blizzard can't take an L, this, this franchise is going to go to the moon. But then reality struck, yeah. other things came in COVID happened uh, you know just the world happens yeah. and games happen like can valorant will valorant be able to over yeah. surpass that as well it's, it's oh. also not just the intro like the competition with other games it's also just like really hard to keep those dopamine receptors filled for zoomers yeah. over <laughs> extended periods of time like it's really hard to uh, create consistent novelty and like exceed expectations in order sure. to make people stick like even without any direct competitor like you gotta beat yourself. Like the the audience is is something that you need to beat as as the mm -hmm. that's the game, right? Not necessarily even whoever else is trying to uh, get the, the that core audience's attention. Yep. Yeah. Absolutely. I think I think it doesn't help matters that you know there there is some you know immediate PR when you know the PVE this and the, you know the the two years of like no development. For the game and people are just kind of oh, yeah no one's defending overwatch that. yeah, yeah no, like, as i said yeah. i think overwatch is heavily fumbled i think it has an yes. incredible ip um yeah. and i think they've fumbled with it pretty hard um mm -hmm. but you know my hope and the thing is like people people are so jaded that they want everything else except for what they love to fail yeah i really hope valorant keeps going like they are yes. pushing the envelope they're doing yes. phenomenal mm -hmm. things i thought i love that game i love playing it i go and i play a bunch of swift play with my partner all the time like it's just it's just a fun game, and I hope mm -hmm. it. I hope it really does live through the test of time. With that said, though, I'm also looking forward to see what the next big game is because we don't. Mm. You never know what it is until it's there. Yes, that's true. That's for damn sure. Auto chess snuck up on me. Oh yeah, I you know that. what I mean. Just out of nowhere, it's like, oh, you played this mod. It's like, well, I don't know. Now you got <laughs> TFT, and you. It's all over the place. Um, as we kind of wrap up, I don't want to take up too much of your time. We did get news about Flashpoint. That is probably something we have to discuss. Initial thoughts, Yiska. I know that you love randomness, and I know that you love uh, new game modes and uh, playoff scenarios, so uh, let me hear it. Right, so to give a little bit of background, so mm -hmm. we essentially, and you can disagree with that framing, um, we're essentially playing control, but like on random locations, right? And the... Sort of. Like... The problem I have with it is that it is actually random where mm. it opens, like the, the specific point open. And because, yes, like parts of the map have um, symmetrical architecture, right? Yeah. And part of the map doesn't as it open up, opens up, right. right? And I know you're a fan of this, Joe, but personally, like I hate when a team gets to a point where it's advantageous for them to sit and not push for the advantage, mm -hmm. but rather wait out, create boring scenarios, and probably sure. win the fight by the opponent having to push into it. Like, that's, that's yeah. a problem I have with push. Um, and theoretically, by that asymmetry, that is theoretically possible here as well, right? Mm -hmm. Even though, like, what's the specific win condition? Do you have to get to uh, three? 
I think, that win, or is is it... I think that was what they were saying. It's like yeah. if the first person to get to three control points wins. Yeah. Is there time so not like a secondary timer? I, I, yeah. Again, that's devils, devils in the details when it comes to a lot of this stuff where it's like, if there is a timer, can you, you know, without to, to use a to steal a term from like fighting games, can you kind of timer scam people where it's just like, you know, oh, we got our point. Now we're just going to like sit into like a really defensible position and stop you from getting to the other points and just sit on ours for 10 minutes and just win, you know, like. Yeah, yeah. There's maybe a theoretical like secondary win condition I mean, that you know we're not talking about, but we hard to know. Even if not, like it would like depending on the meta, it would just suck if you get into map positions where like both should not engage. You know, like the sure. Colosseo sure. like yeah. situation where you're sitting in front of each other three minutes. Now you don't have a time limit, and yeah. like it's not even <laughs> that those those guys like one of those guys is forced to make a play. Yeah, that in itself like i i wonder how it like unfortunately this has to go wrong in pro play a couple of times before we even mm -hmm. discuss finding a solution um True. and i also don't foresee that probably being the case with too many compositions another thing i don't like is apparently like the first location is only revealed once the doors open that just screams to uh, switch best to me like that's just sure. like yeah. depending mm. on how much you need to travel maybe like you roll up with another comp maybe depending on what the architecture is you roll up with another comp it just also feels like soup like a shitload to prep if my math is right the teams will probably get two weeks with this patch of no mm. play to prepare for this i'm not sure if that's enough especially also with the new hero um it's better than f five days let's be honest sure. Of course. And that's two weeks, I think, before play-ins, so the playoff teams have even more time to prepare. Um, okay. I, I'm I'm still, like, once again, like, this is all very theoretical, and as we know in Overwatch, like, whatever you think about a new hero, how it will interact mm -hmm. with the game or whatever, or, like, new map type and whatnot, you probably won't have a read without, uh, a correct read without actually seeing it in scrims or live matches. So I'm looking yep. forward to that happening. Dude, if by the way, probably no league staff will um will get to this point in the episode, but maybe har harass your favorite team staff across the league with this clip. Make it possible for me to just sit in your scrims and analyze how the meta evolves in the first two weeks. I wanna like I I can anonymize it. I just like would describe the broad meta strokes and how teams figure out this map incrementally mm. i'll sit there all night for the first two weeks and just look how the ma map meta evolves and just like describe that to the audience without you know giving anything ne necessarily away that would you be so cool names. right like yeah. or even if you don't want money sitting in those scrims just like try to with the VODs. Uh, yeah not vods but like try to have a little you know notepad for me to you, you know like compare then i'll do the same for apac or whatnot and see mm -hmm. like how those regions try to figure it out because that is one of the coolest aspects uh historically to just see like how do metas or play styles evolve uh, and when a new completely new mode launches especially as complex i think theoretically yeah. this has a chance to like be very played very differently than uh, the overwatch we played before it could also just be very the same <laughs> and it could just be control you know um <laughs> And I, we'll see. And I wonder, like, if if we will find out that control dreams are generally also pretty good at this map type, and actually, in all, what everything okay. that we uh -huh. did is just like, you know, one large like XXL menu of control. <laughs> um, fancy control to end it's the like series, a seamless guys. control, right? Yeah, like yeah, yeah. The way you're going from point to point. Like for mm -hmm. for me, the from just looking at it, and they talk about the scope and the size of these maps is yeah, mobility is going to be king. And yes. I think that is always a problem whenever you have, it's the same thing with control of like mobility is king because you need to get to the point first, you need to, uh, then you can control and then you can get back faster. Like I think Lucio right now is going to be a must pick. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't be surprised if the new hero that they're planning on introducing is a hero that provides mobility or provides some form of assistance in that way that could counter lucio because people have been saying for a very long time there needs to be something or someone who will rival lucio mm -hmm. and if that is you know coming in first of all i welcome that i would great to have more options other than one person who provides speed boost but sure you're going to need a lucio right now like there has to be you just look at these maps 
Yeah. And then the question becomes, are we playing dive because you want to get there really fast? Or are we playing a brawl because you want to get there fast and then just hold your ground? It's it seems like there's a lot of chokes all around these maps right now, which would get a lot of value from your Symmetras, your Maze, yeah. and those type of things. So I don't want to really speak too much about it because it'll become very clear, like a lot of the pain points that Yiska's saying will sure. become very clear very quickly of like, is this a problem? I have to err on the side of surely they know what they're doing um, when they're trying this out of like, how will this play out? Because you don't want it to just be something. Because I agree with Yiska. Any situation in which not going for the objective mm -hmm. is the best course of action is a bad game design. Yep. If I see that, the, like, let's say we're looking at this point and it's in the far corner of the map. If the points capture fast enough that it's like, well, we can just give that one up give 30 seconds and we know where the next one's going or we can just zone them out of the next one. Yeah. That'll give us an advantage and then that'll give us an advantage for the next point after that because they're stuck in a corner of the map. Then it does. Another thing as well is how do spawn duels work here? Yep. Like if we're going all over the map, <laughs> yeah. who's, it, it, does that mean one person's going to have an advantage on some spawns or are the spawns going to be retroactively moving from both sides based on what spawn point is alive? How does that work if the yeah. map has been flipped by both teams of where the spawn door is, are you going to get zoned out? Like, there's a lot of questions that need to be answered, yeah. and nothing of what they've shown us so far has yeah, really answered that because that's very nitty gritty competitive of course, stuff. Yeah. Of, is it balanced? I yeah. would, I would like if I try to meta read this. I think you know, like when we had the when the spawns uh, relocated, let's say on push, they got mm -hmm. had this new tech come in where you could teleport to the other spawn, right? Yes. Yeah. I feel like this was made for this map type. A hundred percent. Yeah. Maybe. Yeah. So uh, maybe it's like COD where you get you like multiple pick your spawn, spawn locations. Doors, yeah, yeah. <laughs> picking on the respawn. That would be interesting. That solves a lot of like the questions that I had where it was like, you know, I think um I think Aaron Keller uh talked about how the the walk back time. I, I think he used the verbiage walk back time off of respawn was the same for each team, which is great. It's I love mm. to hear that. But the issue arises when it's like, okay, red team won the first team fight, blue team lost. Now red team caps the first point and exists on the map, so they don't have to walk back. They just rotate. Yeah. Where blue team has to actually walk back, thus making the walk back time not equivalent. So it's like, again, what is there? Are there multiple spawns? Can you choose them? Like what you're saying, Custom? And it, it again, a lot of this is detail driven. I'm glad that it's simple. I'm glad that it's not some crazy new, uh, here we go, guys, we're playing kill confirmed and we got to grab the dog tags of our favorite Overwatch. Like, what if nothing... there's a bus that flies yeah. over the top and you can <laughs> jump out of it so you can choose where you land? I don't know. There you go. You know? Yeah. I'm glad it's not just out of the woodwork and it does feel kind of like similar where it's like, okay, well, it's fancy control. You know, another point that it felt, I felt was kind of, very familiar was a lot of the same talking points that they used about push where it's like oh yeah we're we're trying to like open up the map and we want you to flank and think about all the opportunity and it's like well guys it's it's still overwatch like we're gonna stick together and run around like sometimes we'll do a oh, crazy flank but like yeah we have a big map now nobody's everybody's gonna still do the same thing like i i it feels like they're still trying to like force this like we want you guys to disperse, like break apart from the death ball, like really reach out and touch people. And it's like, it's, I just don't see that happening in this game, guys. It's been seven years. Apex, you know, going into the Overwatch Open shout outs. It, it's never happened. I don't think it's gonna give them a big map. Maybe like you said, like we don't know. It's hard to tell. It's a new game mode, but I don't know. I'd, I'd place my bets I on. I will say. Mm -hmm. I think this looks better than 2CP. Just like, like yeah, off of the bat. Yes, like, agree, I, agree. I, I don't see how this could go so terribly wrong that it would be just like worse than what we've had in the mm -hmm. far, past. I, I, it looks fun. It looks like yeah. how Overwatch should be played. Agreed. The only other concern that I have is if it's three capture points, how quickly do they tick up? Yes. Can I finish a game in four minutes? Yep. That was like, going to be uh, my next point. Yeah, no, I, I think it, like, if I look at the, the percentage timer, it feels a little bit faster than regular control, maybe. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it should, because otherwise you just have, like, you know, control, but with five maps. Yeah. Um, I also don't think you will actually have too many intermediary fights between points in transition. That yeah, I think it, would, it wouldn't be in anyone's best interest to fight before. 
Yeah. Unless like a tracer gets like a pick and then you can collapse or whatever. But I think also yeah. the size of the map just makes it very opportune to, you know, rotate effectively out of mm -hmm. way and like reset the fight that way. But yeah, I, I, if I'm reading this correctly, I, I also, of course, the, the, the speed can be very easily balanced. I think that sure, like, the yeah. charge time is something very easily changeable if your uh, games just take too long. But yeah, it's it's intriguing to think about because it's also really hard to get right. Like, um, mm -hmm. yeah. And then old states transition between points and like it, that's also another different thing. And like, how does that snowball? And it's... Yeah, it's super hard to to foretell, and then especially what you said, like that would have been my next point. Like, how long does this map type take? Like, is it yeah. is it ten, fifteen? Like, is it less? I don't know. It's it's a weird one. I think if if you can average it out to like twelve minutes a game, like ten that's minutes fair. a game, I think yeah. that's the perfect situation. I think that's where push. I think pretty heavily struggles right now is like mm. I. I played a game yesterday where I was in a 15 minute queue and we joined that game and we won in like two and a half minutes. Like <laughs> the game just wasn't balanced. We won and I was like, well, guess we go back in queue, right? <laughs> like that. And that just feels really bad when the game mm. is, you know, a quarter of the length of the queue that I waited to play it. Um, yeah. So I, I, I'm curious to see how that's going to play for this game mode as well. Am I the only one who like has PTSD when it comes to like the old control, like best of five, double up the sub maps, get the random ones back in the day? I, I don't know which dev I have to speak to to get off this random control nonsense, but I don't know. Uh, yeah, I don't know. I feel like control is just the best kind of way to like fight because you're like yeah, forcing an option. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So. I don't know. Like, I agree with you. Like, this, you know, a, a lot of people, like, you know, I, I don't blame the devs because, you know, no, obviously no, no. they want to create, yeah, no. uh, you know, they, they're creating things, they have to be excited about it. But yeah. it's, it is control, but they took hard point from COD and just sort of like moved it yeah. around. Right. And that's, that's, I actually think it's a great game mode. And I, I'm surprised no mm -hmm. one's really thought about it uh, earlier. But yeah, it, this isn't doing anything new. So, and that's one of my optimisms yeah. as well. It's like, this isn't something new. There is a pretty set formula that people know is successful. Yeah. It is the there is beauty in that simplicity and like now that it's fancy control with like a really big map that's persistent, how does that you know that is a very fundamental way to change a you know a game type like what does that do? Ideally, maybe that changes up some things, maybe adds some avenues for some playmaking, which would be cool. I'm skeptical, but we'll see. And then that's kind of the the interesting part. It's it's not an immediate turn off. It's like a cautious optimism right I, th I think that's kind of the the vibe of the room yeah yeah if, if, okay the, what do you guys think or do we know is, this is going to be the first in a best of five right or rather first first to three i don't know I, I i do know that there were like talks about this of like where would be the best to put it um i think a lot of people like starting with control maybe they would put it first i don't think you'd ever want to put it last yeah because then you would very rarely see it i would like to have it like third at least when it first gets introduced sure. i think you want to play it yeah. like you want to see That's it get fair. played every series if you're doing a best of uh three oh sorry first of three um i think i don't think anyone would be upset if push went to five right like yeah i don't think but then your best me. moments are on push like your like hype maps it's like do you really want to have the great equalizer on map five be push yeah it's a tough it's one yeah. I, I just want it to be figure it out and just stick to it and then maybe if we want to revisit what that format looks like in 2024 i just have a a gripe with maybe how last year we integrated we tried to integrate push where it was like okay well what if we have like uh like off weeks where we have two push game modes and we actually don't play control and it's like oh that kind of sucks like because we don't yeah. know how to play this game <laughs> and it's yeah. not good as long as we're not like doing anything super crazy i'm okay with it let's just pick pick a spot stick it there and we'll figure it out as we learn it it's yeah, not yeah you know fortunately the formula. we have five game modes and five maps now yes so, which is great you know that it, it'll There's be no hard doubling to do up. it yeah we're not doubling up push yeah where we play new queen street and then we play coliseo yeah. again and again and again and again funnily enough i was looking at uh, atlanta rains uh, rains win rates the only two mad, uh, maps they lost in the regular season were actually control so control. by removing yep. one control that actually might help them, you know? Um, yeah, but well, then now they're playing fancy control, so, like, does it... Sure. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah, I, I, it'll be interesting to see if it has the same level of RNG because, like, yeah. uh, control is an RNG is. kind of control because it's like it is really dictated very quickly by like the first team fight. Yes. I think is really important, and yeah. then like very random things heavily change the outcome of our, any round of cough, and that's why it does go. It is probably the most variable game mode that exists. Yep. So, will this have the same issue? It's it, yeah. it, it's always like a knife fight where you it always felt that way in goats too where it was like you know you win that first fight you snowball the resources you get that lead maybe third fourth fight you you get the bank thrown at you and then you reset but you also it, like there is there was that like economy war and it yeah. and it always kind of feels that way where it's really tough to see somebody like claw all the way back and win it like 100 to zero is you know as much as maybe that sticks out in people's minds the math again supports like that's just not common yeah um so there's there's always that 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 draw to like oh, i wish control was just a little bit longer where we get like not comebacks but like we get a truer sense of like what's going on because like you said one thing goes wrong one way for the the favorite team and it's like oh well all right well that's a, that's a map go to yeah. game two it's just it doesn't always feel good it just yeah it just feels weird at times especially when yeah. you play it on one and five so I'm mm -hmm. welcoming a new game mode. Yes, 100%. Because, you know, the, the, the not so secret secret uh, is that a lot of people just scrim a lot of control because it's the best game mode to scrim, right? Like, it's the most played game mode. If I start it and end it and we're the best at control, then we have the best chances of winning, right? Yeah. It's also the most fun. I, I think a lot sure. of people would, uh, would agree that I think control is one of the most fun game modes because it does mm -hmm. feel very fast and, yep. like, you know. It, it it feels like you're getting value and like you're always fighting unlike hybrid and that kind of stuff where it feels like you can get caught in chokes and you yeah. know that kind of like dumb stuff so who's pushing the car what are we where's yeah, the yeah. you know it's just very simple it's very true to overwatch um and yeah so uh, also, flash point is interesting just a minor side point because as yeah. a person with a you know pretty scuffed pc I really hope, like when I hear big map size, yeah. I'm sweating for my frame rate. <laughs> like, <laughs> of course, like Blizzard historically is one of the best ones about op optimizing um, mm -hmm. and like not having these hiccups. But like, oof, hopefully that doesn't tank, uh, you know, frame rate too I'm much. I'm sure it'll be all right. I'm sure you'll be good. You won't be overheating. I know you said Diablo is eating your stuff, but. Yeah. <laughs> We'll Diablo see. does sure. eat everything. Yeah. <laughs> All right, because because I think Yiska prior to the show was like, bro, is Diablo like ruined in your PC? Because I got to restart it after a while. So, yeah, I think yeah. you're you're putting some some nerves at ease for him as as much as he's abused his computer to say uh not to not to out the man. It's the only game that like my graphics card fans just start whirring yeah. randomly <laughs> like every like a couple of seconds. It's like well, okay, cool. Very good. I hope it don't crash. Yeah, I'm tired I hope of it doesn't restarting. Break. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> All right, thank you so much, Cussa, for coming on and talking about the midseason madness, Flashpoint, all all things Overwatch at the moment. Um, anything you know you want to say to the fans? Any anything you want to plug? Anything coming up? No, thanks for having me on once again. It was fun talking about all these things. You know, yeah. it was uh, it's always fun. You know, hearing your guys' perspectives because you know, as I said, I watch a lot of your stuff and like your interviews and stuff. But it's always fun. You know, just chatting, chatting, chatting the shit. You know, yeah. especially with so much coming up in Overwatch. Um, yeah, no, thanks thanks to fans for sticking through it. I'm looking forward to mm -hmm. this new uh, playoffs that's coming through. I think we've got a bunch of breaks coming up. I don't know really what's planning on going on, but you know, I'm looking forward to this playoffs. Hopefully it should be an absolute banger. Um, yeah, check, check out my stream if you want to hear me talk about more random stuff and playing some Overwatch. i got a few weeks break before we come back to season, so I'm, I'm breaking off some rust on the support. <laughs> He's spinning up the old support. Yes, guy, what's coming down the pipeline? Yeah, um, first off, thanks to Custer for coming on. Uh, between, you know, like being in those eternal scrims and uh, like trying yeah. out once again. <laughs> so, but um, yeah, like uh, I'm, I actually sit down with another player to, uh, to more. I guess I can just say it here because nobody's going to get through that part of the episode anyway, but I'm going to sit down with Aspire. Toxic. Um, oh, you nice. know, freshly cool. called up uh, US boy. Uh, we'll we'll talk about that with him, um, and then next week probably Christopher. I would say 
of course a lot of um a lot of teams are currently on vacation it's like mm -hmm. yeah. this is the week where it's hard to get interviews and then hopefully yeah. as the break so we're going to start scrimming again i think generally like around the 25th 26th is when like a lot of teams i talk to start up scrimming again and hopefully i get get to catch some players uh you know just coming off vacation all righty go check out cuss's stream just is doing crazy stuff Thank you so much for watching the episode. Uh, we'll be back with 303 uh, coming probably next week. We'll talk, probably, you know, do some review. I'm sure there'll be some more roster moves. So stay tuned. All that stuff. 303. We'll see you next week. Adios.